doors now. Co- co- it's not on? Yes. Okay. The April 10, 2023 regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. May we please have a roll call. Councilmember Grisanti. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Stewart? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Here. Mayor Silverstein? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, can we get a volunteer from the audience to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Donald. Anybody? Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. It's like the Army. Step back. Everyone else steps back. Flags out. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kelsey, can we please have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on March 30th, 2023, with the amended agenda pro- posted on April 7th, 2023. Thank you very much. And um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll approve the agenda. I'd like to make an uh, uh, adjustment to the agenda order. If we could move uh, 6D to 6A. That's the uh, Picasso timeshare issue. Anybody have any objection to? Well, who? Marianne, it's your motion. Do you accept that as a friendly amendment? Uh, I'll accept that. Paul? I'm. What was the motion? Move um, the Picasso matter to 6A. I believe it's 6D to 6A is what you're looking for, right? I, what am I doing wrong? I look at my 6B and it's review of homeless. D. Six, uh, D. D is in dog. D is, D is in dog. dog. Okay. <clears throat> now I can hear. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Any other proposals? Can we please have a roll call? Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to ceremonial presentations, and I see first we have a presentation on Santa Monica College Malibu campus. Alice Meyering, Associate Dean for the SMC Malibu campus, will present. Pull the mic down, please. And City Manager McClary, thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce myself at your meeting. I am Alice Myring, Associate Dean of Santa Monica College's Malibu campus, and I feel privileged to stand before you to give you this report of the operations at the Malibu campus, as well as some of the plans this campus has for the near future. The Malibu campus began welcoming students for the spring semester of 2023 on February 13th. For this first semester, we have roughly 450 students enrolled in 26 classes that spread across four different educational modules. We have four credit classes for students pursuing a degree, non-credit classes that offer students flexibility in career advancement and other educational options. Emeritus classes for older adults seeking self-enrichment and community education program, a fee-based program that caters to working professionals. As you might not yet have the opportunity to visit our campus, I thought I would show you a series of images of the campus in action. As you can see, the campus is currently enjoyed by students with most of our equipment now in place such as the furniture on the second floor student lounge area, as well as vending machines for snacks and drinks. Since all the classes at the Malibu campus are in person, the staff are in the office daily. 
I'm assisted by three office staff, an administrative assistant, a media resources assistant, and a student services specialist. Currently, we also have one dedicated campus security officer and one dedicated custodial uh, staff during the day. The media resources assistant is responsible for troubleshooting classroom equipment, management of digital information, and maintenance of our website. The student services specialist help interested community members with the registration process and while designing surveys to gauge student interests and is responsible for student data analysis. It's fair to say that the entire team here at the Malibu campus aims to give our students, faculty, and visitor a satisfying in-person experience. Next slide, please. I do not know how, where is the clicker? As I mentioned before, there are 26 classes taking place here for the spring semester of 2023. At, this, at the time of this report, we're already halfway through the spring semester. Some classes such as statistics in English 1 and 2 are high in enrollments because these are popular uh, general education class requirements. But other classes such as general psychology and uh, film appreciation are also of great interest for the students. Older adults are able to enjoy robust class, uh, art classes thanks to our emeritus program. Generally speaking, 70% of our students are traditional students who graduated high school within the past five years. And over a third of our students come from Malibu and the surrounding areas. Not surprisingly, the community is very curious about the campus. And we've had visitors from local community organizations, local nonprofits, educational institutions, local media, as well as individuals. We're actively engaging the local community and forming partnerships that are mutually beneficial. Most importantly, Santa Monica College is looking to serve the Malibu community by providing easier access to educational classes. The Malibu Times very generously printed a front page story uh, about the campus in its February issue. Many of the organizations that you see listed here will also participate in our open house event on April 22nd, but more on that later. One of the first things we did in the spring semester is to partner with Malibu High School to survey their students for classes they're interested in for our dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment programs. The Malibu High School counselors and principal Patrick Miller were particularly helpful and welcoming, and we were able to participate in their coffee with the counselor and support period on March 15th to interact with parents and students respectively. Santa Monica College recruiters were also present on these occasions to give students important information about concurrent enrollment and dual enrollment programs, which will help the students to get ahead in their academic careers. As a result of the student survey we conducted with the help of the Malibu High School that began in the middle of February, Santa Monica College was able to schedule Music 37 which is Music in American Culture for summer of 2023, and Stella Astronomy and Counseling 20 for the fall of 2023, working around the bill schedules of the high school. Community education, in addition, has also scheduled conversational Spanish in this summer for added interest. We want the community to know that Santa Monica College takes all feedbacks seriously, and we respond quickly to give the community what they need to further their educational goals. I'm happy to report that we have some exciting events coming up later this month, uh, April 20, uh, 22nd. The ribbon cutting for the Malibu campus in the morning, an open house for the community in the afternoon. 
As I mentioned before, many of our community groups, as well as the SNC community, are slated to participate in our open house. This is a great opportunity for the Malibu community to interact with Santa Monica College and for them to experience the campus firsthand. Most importantly, we want the community to know that our campus is here for them and that this is a place where people can come together to do great things. Visitors of the open house will have the chance to participate and observe class demonstrations, mini lectures, music performances, and wellness workshops, just to name a few. The Malibu Community Emergency Response Team, as well as the Sheriff's Volunteers on Patrol and Arson Watch will also take part in the open house to promote emergency awareness and public safety. Last but not least, Santa Monica College is happy to announce that the Malibu campus will be hosting the State of the City on Wednesday, May 3rd, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We are looking forward to welcome the City Council of Malibu and other esteemed members of the community to our campus on this momentous occasion. Besides providing easier access for educational classes for the local community and promoting lifelong learning, we see community outreach and building relationships and engaging with our surrounding communities as major goals. I have already mentioned some of the partnerships earlier, and we are still in the early stages of solidifying these relationships. Our hope is that given a little more time, we will be able to provide meaningful public programming that everyone can enjoy and appreciate. With the Malibu campus, Santa Monica College hopes to add more to the Malibu community. Recently, we have launched our Malibu 24-7 Instagram to engage the community visually. The idea is that everyone and anyone can tag and share the Malibu they see 24-7. We believe there is so much to Malibu that there is no end to exploring every facet of this amazing place. We hope that this Instagram is just one of the many instances where this campus can serve as a place where everyone's vision comes together and that in the many, we see the entirety. On this final slide, we have a QR code linking to our campus landing page through our college website. And my email address is also listed for your reference. Our Malibu mainline 310 434-8600 is monitored Monday through Friday during normal business hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Once again, I thank the City Council for allowing me to make this presentation to you tonight. Thank you for your time. I look forward to welcoming you to our campus very soon. Thank you for the presentation. Much appreciated. Now, we, does anybody have any questions? Anybody? The council? I, I'd just like to say thank you very much. I mean, you've, I, I live above the college, and over the course of the time you've been building this thing, you guys have been great neighbors. So thank you very, very much. And I wish you the very best with this process. Okay. That takes us to 1B, another presentation on 2022 environmental programs accomplishments. Uh, environmental, environmental Sustainability Director Yolanda Bundy will present. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Tonight is our second Environmental Programs Accomplishments presentation. Next slide, please. This evening, we'll be presenting the Events and Outreach Environmental Focus Areas. Next slide, please. Outreach and Events is item 5H on our work plan. This is the fifth priority set by Council that establishes to enhance the environmental efforts and protect and improve water resources. Next slide, please. I will pass the presentation to Karen De La Cruz. Thank you, Yolanda. Good evening, City Council, Mr. Mayor. So starting off, we will be uh, focusing our presentation on outreach and events. 
So one of our primary ways to coordinate events and outreach is with partners. The MAC, or the Malibu Area Conservation Coalition, is a partnership of local government agencies, schools, utilities, resource districts, and other stakeholders working in the Malibu area that share the common goal of empowering the community to conserve and protect its natural resources. At the last meeting, we discussed landscaping workshops and the rain barrel giveaway, which we hope to host at City Hall in later this year in the fall. Previously, these meetings were held monthly. They have been since moved to quarterly, and the next meeting will be April 25th. Through the MAC, city staff has been able to maintain its successful partnerships, and we hope to work with them later on this year. In addition to our community partners, we work even closer interdepartmentally. Most recently, we have coordinated with the Community Services Department to provide outreach in their quarterly recreation guides, which is mailed to every address in Malibu. We include a calendar of upcoming events, an article, and ads for environmental programs, and we've used the last newsletters to promote the organic waste recycling program and the virtual workshops. On a more regular basis, we use the bi-weekly city manager update to provide information to the community, and this update is also posted on our website. The environmental team organizes regular and seasonal events to encourage recycling and other sustainable practices. In the spring of 2022, EDSD staff joined the Bay Foundation at Zuma and Point Dune beaches, where we were able to restore approximately three acres of the dune. Students spent the morning learning about both native and invasive plants and their impact on our beaches and taught how to properly remove these invasive plants. Our most attended events as of late have been the household hazardous waste and e-waste collection events. For example, the city collected approximately 1,200 pounds of e-waste in 2022 and the city's annual bulky item pickup, which was also very popular, generated 1.9 tons of trash, three tons of metal, one fridge, four printers, and five computers. Following the 2022 holiday season, the city hosted its Christmas tree recycling where residents could bring their old Christmas trees to be properly recycled within a two-week period, and 2.34 tons of Christmas trees were collected and recycled. So last week, April 4th, the environmental programs team hosted a booth at Pepperdine where staff was able to connect with students and university staff, promote upcoming Earth Month events, provide environmental education and outreach, and pass out fun giveaways such as metal straws, aluminum water bottles, and kitchen caddies, and etc. Here are some photos from the event. The environmental programs booth attracted a great amount of student engagement where students asked questions about the city's environmental responsibilities and accomplishments on topics like water quality programs, organic waste recycling, renewable energy, and plastic bans. The event was deemed successful due to overall participation and positive feedback from students and staff. ESC staff will continue to work with Pepperdine Center for Sustainability to promote future city environmental events. Here are some more photos at the event with student engagement and the team. On April 6th, last week, city staff attended the Malibu Library Speaker Series at Pepperdine for a 2023 Climate Calling Conference. Dr. Britt Way presented on how to mentally cope with the climate crisis, personal climate distress, climate anxiety, and eco-grief. In her presentation, a couple of keynotes that I would like to mention were that how she stresses the importance of frontline agencies to support their community with any climate anxiety or stress they may have with educational tools and resources. She also notes how vital it is for a community to have a high social capita, Moreover, how communities that have a high social capita have been shown to adapt and fight climate change at a more of a strong network. <laughs> Funded by CalRecycle, environmental program staff will continue to host the monthly organic trainings, which will highlight the importance of organic waste recycling, waste reduction, edible food recovery, community participation, SB 1383 requirements. Kitchen caddies will also be provided to residents who attend these trainings. 
So to promote the program and reach out to residents, event details and unique graphics are posted on the city website, Malibu TV, Malibu Times newspaper ad, and also on all of our social media platforms. And one thing to note, so according to our social media analytics, since October 2022, since the beginning of the program, the engagement rate has grown for the organics recycling program on our social media posts. Instagram posts have increased uh, engagement by 11% and on Twitter by 8%. More community involvement is expected in the future as the program attracts recognition and support. And now I'll we'll pass it off to Yolanda. Thank you, Karen. Looking forward to provide our residents with more engagement opportunities, our Environmental Programs Division is reinstating our partnerships with LA County Public Works for our Smart Gardening Workshop that is due in April. In addition, city staff will also be reestablishing collaboration with the West, Bas West Basin Municipal Water District to provide landscape classes and the rain barrel distribution event this fall. Next slide, please. We regularly host monthly meeting for organic uh, recycling training. We are also be adding a youth commission training. One of the commission's work plan is to coordinate with our environmental sustainability programs. At their last meeting, the commission discussed discuss ways to work with ASD staff and to preserve organic recycling for a younger community. We will continue to partner with the Youth Commission for future environmental events. Our team will be hosting an in-person training for our seniors so they can share, so we can share with them the importance of recycling and waste reduction. The participants will be receiving a free kitchen caddy. Next slide, please. We are extremely excited to invite the City Council and the Malibu residents for the upcoming events on April and May. To be updated on the event information, you need to sign up to our e-notification or just call us at our department. Next slide, please. One of these exciting events and one that is always most popular is our document shared at day. It will happen Saturday, April 15 at 10 a.m. This is a drive-through event with a limited of five boxes per household where the residents may securely dispose of their personal or business records. We invite you to participate. This will be, this will be take uh, place at the city hall on the upper parking lot. Next slide. We're also excited that we are gonna be uh, having an event for Smart Gardening. It will happen Saturday, April 22nd at 10 a.m. ESD staff is, offer is offering this workshop in coordination with the County Public Works Department. This program will offer training for at the C at City Hall on the multi-purpose room. Compost bins will be also available and will be discounted to our residents after the workshop so they might be able to learn and practice what they have learned. To celebrate our day, ESD staff will be on site to give up native plants and organic recycling bins for that day. We look forward to seeing everyone at that, at that training. This concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments from City Council? Marian? Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, you guys are doing fantastic work. Um, I see with SMC here, perhaps, um, you can also reach out and there could be some joint par uh, partnerships uh, with environmental programs, given the location with SMC, Legacy Park, ESD. Uh, maybe we can get some environmental programs for teaching about uh, water quality and other things, um, and also with the youth, youth Commission, that would be fantastic see, to see those partnerships being formed there. And uh, just great job. Thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. Yeah, Steve? 
Uh, Yolanda and your team, thank you very, very much. You guys are doing one heck of a job. Uh, if you, you embody what Malibu is all about, protecting the environment, protecting our community. So I thank you very, very much for the effort you're putting in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you once again. That takes us to um, communications from the public. Item 2A, we will now hear communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda. Remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item. And first we'll take the speakers who are in the room. And we have Jefferson Wagner, followed by Pam Eilerson, followed by Dermot Stoker. And then I'll read the other names once we have these three. Good evening, council members, and thank you for your participation and your wonderful leadership here in the city of Malibu. This evening I'm here on behalf of a couple of HOAs up at Trancus and Broad Beach. Uh, about a decade or so uh, ago, myself and John Seibert, council member Seibert, and I were assigned to help with the GAD, the Geological Hazardous Abatement District up at uh, Broad Beach and Trancus. And for those of you that are new, I put together a quickie kind of schematic. Once again, it can be corrected. It's not like a real flow sheet. It's, I use the word taxonomy. Um, I think Mark helped me out get it uh, on, so we can get it on the screen so those at, at home can see it. Is that Alex back there that might help us with that? Okay, Alex is on it and then, then folks at home can see the, uh, the chart. The chart basically explains uh, the players involved with the GAD. And to this, to this date, they haven't had a sand delivery because of all the complications that go on through government agencies. That's why I listed the government agencies on this taxonomy. Tonight, there are a number of speakers here, homeowners and speakers, all here, as you can see, in great numbers, uh, to help you make a decision to put this back up on the agenda. That's the ultimate goal is to get this agendized. And uh, I think that's due after all these years, two, 10 years that I know of. There, there's the chart. So those at home can kind of follow it. Once again, it's not actually a chart of how it flows because the Coastal Commission has a greater participation on some of these decisions than the city of Malibu. But those are the players and those are the issues. And I want to thank you very much and consider putting this on the agenda in the next month or so. I think it's needed. Homeowners have changed. We have at least 10 or 15 new homeowners in the area, and they haven't had a chance to weigh in on this. And we have a number of speakers, and they're going to come up next. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, my compensation for this in front of you is it's candy. It's not opened. Thank you very much, Council. <laughs> thank you. Pam Eilerson. I'm here to speak for the 235 homeowners of Malibu West, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, some others are watching on Zoom, and I think you received a lot of emails from us as well. The Malibu West Board of Directors respectfully asks the Malibu City Council to revisit the 2011 Resolution 1141, which created the Broad Beach GAD. Um, we make this request based on the GAD's lack of compliance with the material conditions contained in Resolution 1141. Our Malibu Beach Clubhouse is included within the GAD Assessment District, which is why we care. In its 2011 story about the council's formation of the GAD, the Malibu Times reported that it was estimated that Malibu West would have to pay between $25,000 and $35,000 to the GAD for beach replenishment, and further noted that uh, our request to have a seat on the GAD board of directors was denied by the city council. At that time, the estimated cost of the project was around $12 million, and it was estimated that it would begin in 2012. Spoiler alert, didn't. It has been 11 years since the council created the GAD and not a single grain of sand has made its way to Broad Beach. The bulk of the 20 plus million dollars in assessment raised by the GAD thus far has gone to lawyers, engineers, and consultants. 
The project is mired in logistical and legal difficulties. A judge has ruled that the project as proposed cannot be built. Many of the Broad Beach homeowners who initially voted for the GAD 11 years ago have since sold their properties, saddling the new owners with a yearly assessment they never voted for. We've heard that some Broad Beach residents were forced to sell their homes because they couldn't afford to pay as much as $70,000 a year to the GAD. That 12 million estimate has ballooned to north of 50. That's 50 every 10 years. And far from the 25,000 to 35,000 that was estimated as Malibu West share back in 2011, we have now spent over $700,000 for nothing. If the project can overcome the substantial roadblocks in its way, it's a big if, the GADS board, board's current plan for beach replenishment would require 44,000 one-way dump truck trips on our roads over a three to five month period, and that's every five years. This is not the plan that was presented to the City Council in 2011. The City Council created the GAD, and only you can dissolve it. Based on the GAD's lack of results over the last 11 years and its dubious prospects for success, Malibu West urges you to take that step. And we'd like to thank our members who are here tonight and who are watching on Zoom and who sent emails to the City Council. This is uh, an issue which is of great importance to our membership. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, we're having some technical difficulties with the microphones on the floor, so we're going to take a short break and see if we can't fix them.
No, they're just working on. There we go. Okay, sorry for that delay. Welcome back. Okay, so our next speaker is Dermot Stoker, followed by Scott Dittrick, Tim Bice, and Lloyd Ahern. That'll be all of the uh, live speakers or in person speakers. Gotcha. Copy, copy. Check, check. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. Dermot Stoker, I live in Malibu West, and I've been there 36 years, I think, raised the kids there. Um, this whole geological hazard abatement district thing has been an absolute boondoggle. We've been for 12 years at $700,000. Uh, we've had no help. We got no sand delivered, and thankfully, Mother Nature has delivered sand back to replenish our beach. So we really don't need uh, the thousands of trucks, at least in our specific part of the beach, to be replenished. Uh, so would you please put on the agenda, upcoming agenda, as soon as possible, uh, that we could have uh, our members come and speak to it and have you guys get a little more information about it and hear from us and how important it is for us to be removed from the jihad uh, because uh, you thought it would be appropriate for us to be involved in that. And we are actually just on the edge of the rock revetment that was put up to protect everybody on Broad Beach. And our, our neighbors uh, to the west of us are all covered by the rock revetment. We, uh, and I guess thank goodness, we didn't get that uh, sort of punishment with the revetment because the sand has all come back. And we really don't need... Uh, to spend dime one any more, uh, any more money on this. And as, as uh, Pam Allison spoke eloquently about the, the funds that have gone into this, the Broad Beach Homeowners Association has put in $20 million over 12 years. Not one grain of sand has been de de deposited back on Broad Beach with this grandiose uh, uh, project to, to re-sand uh, the beach. It's, it's been an absolute joke. And everybody's suffering from a major sense of humor failure, especially our homeowners uh, board of directors, because they keep having to write checks for this god awful amount. I mean, this, this, these engineers and this, this attorney that's heading up this program, they're printing our money and putting it in their accounts, and we have absolutely zero benefit from it. So, uh, from this point on, I mean, we've we've got to stop this. This is absolutely ridiculous. So please put this uh, removal of our homeowners association. Um, uh, on the uh, to remove the, the, our homeowners association from this geological hazard abasement district because it's it's served absolutely no purpose at all in 12 years and all, all the hundreds of thousands of dollars we spent it's uh, it's time to for a change and I think it should be uh, changed uh, uh, we should be removed from it so please put that on a on a future agenda thank you very much thank you Dermot <laughs> Scott you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, Scott Dietrich, I live in eastern Malibu, but I'm aware of what's going on, what has gone on at Broad Beach. I do support putting this on the agenda so that you guys can have a fuller discussion, and it sounds like maybe end this uh, assessment district. But what I came to speak about is the Homeless Task Force. Uh, later on, under 6A, there'll be a presentation um, from staff, and but I'm not here to speak about that. Um, there has been some discussion, should that task force change its form to an advisory group? And I am totally against that. Scott, um, th that, is, that is the subject that we're going to be discussing later. So if you have general comments that aren't about that specific agenda item, feel free to. Well, the agenda item is the presentation of our report, isn't it? No, the agenda item is for us to have a discussion about what, if anything, we wish to do about the uh, okay. task force. All right. Then I shall move to 6A. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Tim Bice.
Good evening, council members. Uh, Timothy Bice. I'm a member. I'm a homeowner in Malibu West. I've been there since 1985. And um, I was alarmed and heartbroken when our beach got washed away. And I was very excited when this council gave the green light to the GAD. That was 11 years ago. Um, nothing's happened. It's not going to happen. It's just, it's a waste of money. It's a boondoggle. I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said. You heard the numbers from Pam. Dermot spoke to pretty much everything I want wanted to say. I think it's time to take a good look at this. And it's just, the homeowners are just getting bled and they're getting nothing in return. Maybe it's time to give a red light to the GAD. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Lloyd Ahern, you're our last in-person speaker. Good evening, City Council. My name's Lloyd Ahern, and I've got a old story with a new twist, a good twist. It's the Las Tunas Beach, Tuna Canyon intersection with all the fires, with the derelict house, and all the problems and all the fires and everything that's gone on. The other day, the sheriff right here and his gang, police officer Louis Flores, Frank Espinosa, and, and a bunch of other sheriffs cleaned out a full encampment, which was right where they have all the fires. So they did that. Um, the um, two officers that caught the guy that came with a pickaxe to our to our house and knocked all the windows out and everything else has now finally been put. And this is in July. It was finally found a bed for a psychiatric. It's, it's been. We, I've been to the. There's a, there's a psychiatric hospital in Hollywood that nobody knows about. It's a courtroom. I mean, not a hospital, but a courtroom, and it's. It's taken seven visits for us to make sure that he doesn't get out. So he's he's in. I'm going to need Trevor's help and the sheriff's help on May 5th when we want to make sure that there is a restraining order that he can't come back to the beach because he has a bunch of Facebook pages where he's uh, made some very, very aggressive moves towards the women on our beach and has pictures. So what I want to do is just thank Susan Duenas for her gang and all of the things that she's done. Chris Frost, people in the code enforcement, of course, Captain Sutu, and uh, the two officers, uh, Corey Gadnett and Alex Medcalf, who caught the axe guy who jumped off the Palisades down onto Pacific Coast Highway four lanes of highway, ran across, they got their car, they went back down the California incline, went right across PCH, went into the into the parking lot at, at the pier and caught them. Everybody has done an unbelievable job and there's peace and quiet at Las Tunas Beach and I just want to thank you guys. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. Kelsey, that takes us to Zoom. Yes, and since we did have to take a break, I'd remind everyone on Zoom who'd like to speak on 2A, public comment for items not on the agenda to raise their hand. We do have a few speakers for you. First, we'll hear from Chris Wisner. Okay, since we can't see the Zoom screen, can you tell us approximately how many speakers we have? Uh, you have four right now. Okay, thank you. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi guys, I'm Chris Wisner. Um, I was the former president and chairman of the Malibu Pacific Palisades Chamber of Commerce for nearly two years. And I'm a 23 year resident here on in Malibu, living and working on PCH just a mile apart. So I'm gonna jump to it, the problem. Um, I really feel like PCH has never ever been worse. Um, it's getting worse and it's getting scary. And I've seen it all living on PCH. One Thanksgiving, I, in fact, almost got hit in the medium divider near Surfrider Beach. But it's getting even worse than that. Just two weeks ago, I got out of LAX and about 20 minutes into it on PCH. I got in a hit and run with my pregnant wife. 
I had a camera, dashboard camera. I had the license plate called 911. I did everything right and documented it. Two weeks later, the guy is free. Nothing has been done. I stepped it up with Jennifer C2, even though it's out of her jurisdiction. And thank God, she's the only one that did something about it. But I can only do so much. So my point is, PCH is a complete deadly nightmare. And I think there's been a lot of light shed on this by the documentary 21 Miles in Malibu, which really resonated with me deeply because I've seen people die. I've seen people hurt. I've seen bikers hit by cars. I, I've seen it all, and I'm sick of seeing it because I literally live, breathe, and eat here on PCH, a mile apart from my work. So jump into some solutions really quick. Um, I really would love to see that the city executes and completes any of the 56 mentioned solutions from the 2017 case studies mentioned in the documentary I saw. Um, I know some are underway, but I don't think they're done. I would also love to one day see that we utilize traffic drones once LA County approves. There's a company called Data from Sky that does just this. Uh, furthermore, I would love to suggest that we take control of PCH and create our own safer PCH improvement district. And I would love to know, because I've heard it would bankrupt the city to take PCH from Caltrans, but yet, I've never heard what that number is. I would love to know that number so we could work in reverse. And now for my last solution, which I've talked to some people in the city about, um, and I've heard it could be one of the fastest possible solutions. Really, I think it just comes to good education, a safer PCH awareness campaign. You don't have to build anything or do much or even spend much. Really, it comes to something simple things, drastic improved signage. You know, like don't cross the median divider without both sides clear. Don't open your door without looking for a bicyclist coming. Signage could do that. We could do educational programs for employees, uh, employees of all major employers, for tourists, for students of both schools. It's endless what we could do. and We can make a difference right now and we could save lives. And I don't care who does it, even, you know, I, I just want to see it done and make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nicole. Nicole, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Hi, Mayor and Council. I'm Nicole McGinley. This is my first time speaking before this latest council. Thank you for your service and a belated welcome to you both. I, alongside with Malibu for Safe Tech, Lonnie Gordon, and a wonderful working group of community members with the legal guidance of Scott McCullough, have dedicated a great deal of time with prior two councils to sure up and update our wireless telecom ordinance. There is more work to be done and we plan to be speaking again soon, but in a related manner, I see an extension for the telecom consultant CMS in consent. CMS has provided valuable assistance to the city and our residents, and there's absolutely no reason to think about changing. We 100% support this extension, but I don't understand why the only, excuse me, why it's only for a few months instead of the full two years. There's no reason to seek proposals for other firms. Malibu's municipal code sections 2.56.060.g and 2.56.1. Nicole, hold on one yes. second. I, I, I need to be fair to everybody has the same rule this is an this is an agendized item on the consent calendar so um you're gonna oh to... i apologize i thought when it was for consent no, you're gonna, need, so you're gonna need to... entirely so when when we do the consent calendar just ask to pull that item and then you'll have three minutes to speak about that item if there's oh, anything I... else you want to speak about you're you're free to do so now but let's not talk about that item now oh excuse me yes i misunderstood with the new procedure um, with the raised hands, I didn't know we could do that during consent. No problem. Thank you. Thank for... you so much. Sure. Who's next? Next, we'll hear from Mikey Pearson. Hello, City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I'm sorry I'm not there in person with my fellow Malibu West neighbors, but a little touch of COVID has decided to sneak into our house finally. 
Um, I just want to add context to what the other speakers from Malibu West said. Though this project is clearly never going to happen, I just want to remind the city and the city council what would happen if it did go forward. The first load of sand would be 20,000 dump trucks. And take it this way. It's not only 20,000 dump trucks coming into Malibu, it's the same 20,000 dump trucks leaving Malibu. This is a terrible plan that never had a chance. And there's reasons that we can go over when we get our chance, hopefully to speak with the city council, if you'll agendize this. It's a, it's, it's a terrible plan. It needs to officially go away. $20 million has been spent. And as far as I understand, 75% of that's on lawyers, 25% on engineers. So maybe there was good intentions on this plan at one point, but for a lot of reasons, it's never gonna happen. And we appreciate your attention to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Next, we'll hear from Robert Tobin. Hi, my name is Rob Tobin. I'm a Malibu West resident, and I'd like to repeat and amplify what has been said before about the GAD, or as we call it, the Jihad. Uh, I'm asking you to revisit your 2011 resolution 11-41. And uh, I want to go a little further and say that uh, I actually don't believe there was any goodwill in this at any time. I think that this is a scam and a fraud that has, de de you know, it basically stolen $20 million and returned nothing but uh, uh, trouble. And uh, I uh, really strongly uh, ask uh, City Council to uh, end this uh, fraud. Thank you, Robert. And last, we'll hear from Tim Para. Tim, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, got it. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Ranger Tim with the MRCA, and I'd like to give my Malibu report. Um, and I just want to let you know that uh, we conducted daily reports and patrols at Malibu Bluffs and all of our parks for possible new encampments developing in the canyon observed no evidence of new encampments, which is good. Additional ranger patrols were implemented during the weekend and the holidays to enhance public safety in all of our parks. Uh, public officers were also added again to provide parking enforcement and maintenance duties for, during the holiday. Also no service calls and or any incidents were reported, which is good. Patrolled all beach access areas daily for any safety or maintenance concerns removed graffiti at all the signs at Malibu Pier staircase. Also for any ranger services, the number is on all of our posted rule signs, which is area code 310-456-7049. That's 310-456-7049. And all our service calls are documented and responded to the appropriate assistant managers. All of the information about our beach access areas is also on our coastal access page at mrca.ca.gov forward slash coastal access. And if anyone has any comments to clarify and respond as appropriate, and I am here and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ranger Tim. Next, we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Am I, am I on? I can't tell the, this is a new system. We can hear you, Bill. Thank you. It's, okay. Uh, well, I wasn't anticipating the fellow from Merca, but uh, uh, I would like it if you would uh, have your guests quit throwing their trash in my front yard, which is not part of your property, but your guests do it. That's uh, calling your rangers is a waste of time. We've done it before. Bill, you're um, fading in and out. Oh, we can't even get the dogs off the beach. 
Um, it's simply a waste of time to call that ranger number. We've done it. Uh, moving on to the jihad. Uh, while you're at it, get the rocks out of there. Uh, they're going to cause more sand to go away. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Stoker, I agree with you. However, one homeowner down there, he owns a bunch of Porsches. I don't know his name. Uh, had laborers remove sand from the ocean side of all of those rocks and pile them up, oh, double overhead. So there is, has been some sand placed, but that's it. Uh, please get the rocks out of there. Rocks just to increase scouring. Make them take that out of there too. The jihad has been a bad deal from day one. I agree with my friends in Malibu West. Um, they got a very bad deal on this. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And next we'll hear from Azita. Hi. <laughs> yes, uh, hello. Um, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Azita Khalili. I am a member of Malibu West Swim Club uh, since 2011. I also shared my opinion in an email and I wanted to um, Second, what my other neighbors have already mentioned about the uh, GAD, and uh, just remind us all, it is a sign of strength and not weakness to revisit a decision made over a decade ago based on what we have learned since then. I urge you to revisit the membership of our club in the GAD. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes uh, Zoom public comment. Okay, great. Thank you all. That takes us to commission, committee, and city manager updates. And I see that we do have a report from Lottie Charin. Charin. Thank you for getting this fixed. Can you hear me okay? Bring it down low. Yeah, okay. Is that good? Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bruce and City Council members. I'm Lottie Sharon, Chair of the uh, Malibu Arts Commission. Last spring, I requested that the Council conduct a survey to determine potential for an art center in Malibu. At the time, we were told it was not on your work plan. As a response, the Arts Commission connected, conducted a survey of the community as a first step. I'd like to provide you with an update regarding the commission survey. The goal of the survey was to gauge community interest in an art center for the city. The survey was available online and open from December 22nd through February 6th, uh, uh, 2022. Rather than going through each specific detail, I'd like to present sort of a general overview of the resident responses about a center here. Uh, I can email you details later you know, and not take up your time now. We had 512 responses. More than half of those were from people over 60. 95% of the respondents want an art center in Malibu. Some of the amenities they asked for are theater, auditorium, film and screening. Uh, those were both the highest. Uh, they want an art gallery, event space, art studio rooms. The types of exhibitions and shows with the highest responses were film screenings. They also want live theater, live music, art exhibits, and visiting musical artists. As far as location, it's sort of a toss-up. Number one was uh, Ioki property. Also, uh, next on the list is Heathercliff, and then uh, a renovated and upgraded city hall. We asked who should pay for an art center. 75% said a combination of city and private individuals. Uh, operating the Malibu Arts Center, we asked, what do you think about that? And about half of the respondents were in favor of a nonprofit with board members. The other, uh, which was a little less than half, wanted the city with oversight by the commission. I'd like to remind the council that we started uh, trying to develop an arts center concept through the Malibu Arts Foundation in 2006 with the help of then uh, City Council Member Pamela Conley Ulick. In my experience, every council person I spoke with, and I think I've spoken with everyone since then, responds positively to having an art center here. 
when the Arts Task Force was created prior to an Arts Commission creation, we also had that on our agenda. It's now more than 15 years since, since this idea first bubbled up, and still nothing has been done by City Council. The community has spoken, and we have 95% of our respondents wanting this to happen. The Arts Commission sincerely hopes the City Council will finally prioritize this, this project. The Arts Commission is a strong and very hardworking group, and we want to work with you to move this forward. Thank you, Lottie. Does anybody have any questions of Lottie or comments? Okay. City Manager update? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Happy to give my report. Uh, first, I want to give an update on where we're at with the school safety assessment project. Uh, they have completed the physical security assessments for all but one school, uh, and they will be assessing that final school after spring break. Uh, they're also currently analyzing the crime information to assess the risk environment surrounding the schools. Uh, when the schools return from spring break, they will begin interviews with stakeholders. So far, uh, they've received 147 responses from the school safety and security per perception survey, uh, but they are actively soliciting, soliciting more feedback. Uh, they are on track to finish the assessment by this summer. And of course, we will bring that assessment and that report to City Council. Um, also want to report that, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it seems like uh, hardly a day goes by that we uh, do not see uh, uh, more tragedy in the news uh, with uh, uh, mass shootings and, and mass uh, violence events. Uh, and of course, we uh, know that uh, uh, we're certainly not immune to those things uh, in Malibu. Um, so last week, um, city staff met with the sheriff's department, fire department, uh, members of the Santa Monica Malibu School District, and also the uh, Pepperdine uh, Public Safety Department. Uh, to discuss coordination in the event of a mass violence event incident uh, at one of our schools, uh, at a large community event, uh, at a private event, or, or really anywhere within the Malibu uh, community. Uh, so we discussed various scenarios, uh, communication between the agencies, how would we uh, communicate this event out to the public, uh, and how our response would be organized, uh, both in the immediate event and in the aftermath of that. Uh, so I think we had a, a good meeting and uh, be happy to report some further results on that as we uh, continue our coordination. Uh, this Thursday, April 13th, uh, the city will be starting its next series of community emergency response team classes, better known as CERT. Uh, they will be held on Thursday evenings at City Hall for the next seven weeks. Uh, it's not too late to sign up for those who are interested. Uh, if anyone's interested in signing up, uh, please go to malibu.org slash CERT or call City Hall and ask for the Public Safety Department. And as I think we heard from our uh, presentation uh, earlier this evening from Associate Dean Alice Myring uh, from Santa Monica College, uh, we do have uh, the ribbon cutting event coming up. Uh, that's going to be uh, Saturday, April 22nd for the new college from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, and they will be offering tours of the new campus at uh, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, also was noted as part of that presentation that we have the state of the city address, uh, which is also going to be at the new Santa Monica College here in Malibu, and that's going to be Wednesday, May 3rd, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, among the guest speakers will be Supervisor Lindsay Horvath, our own mayor, Bruce Silverstein, and uh, also hearing from uh, uh, members of the Santa Monica College and uh, and also from the uh, chair of the Malibu Pacific Palisades Chamber of Commerce. So put that on your calendar for Wednesday, May 3rd. And uh, also wanted to report uh, coming up for the next council meeting uh, right now for April 24th. Uh, we do have coming back, uh, as council requested, uh, the item for the Bluffs Park uh, local coastal plan interpretation. We'll also be coming back with the Seaview Motel. Uh, and we'll also be hearing uh, the third report from our team on the environmental program. So uh, thank you again for their presentation this evening. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, go to um, 
our interim uh, deputy city manager, Rob Houston, uh, to give us a report on what's happening with the snack shack. So if you give us a moment to pull up Mr. Houston for his report. And then after that, I'll be going to, uh, to Sergeant Soderlin for any report from the Sheriff's Department. Okay, Rob, over to you, Mr. Houston. All right, thank you, uh, city manager and uh, city council. Thank you for the opportunity to give an update on the direction that council gave two weeks ago regarding the uh, reinstatement of a snack shack at Buffs Park. Uh, staff have been working hard on looking at every possible angle to make that goal a success. And originally there was a, um, I think a very great energy and some um, hard work done some by some private citizens to see of getting a uh, trailer that might have a kitchen in it that could be brought down and parked on site and some and some hard work was done towards that. And uh, although that seems possible in many ways, upon doing some extensive research with the LA County Health Department uh, in their permitting process, we uh, don't seem to be able to get to a solution that could see that working in the short term. Uh, knowing that the Little League season is currently in, we're in the middle of it. Uh, it's basically comes to an end in June. There are some playoffs, but it's sort of right now and uh, permitting for that type of facility, either a trailer or a mobile uh, truck, food truck requires a certain type of permitting, which requires that um, either trailer or truck to leave the property every evening and be parked in a commissary address, which would be off site. Uh, would have to be an approved commissary address that has a, in a professional kitchen and where food could be prepared. Uh, and so that leaves it very hard to imagine how the logistics could work when the hope was to have a center that could be centered at the park and stay there for the uh, season's uh, completion. So uh, following that, working with uh, Acting Community Services Director Kristen, myself, and uh, closely with Council Member Riggins, we uh, put our thoughts together and have found an option for a temporary food facility that the LA County Health Department looks like they could permit in very short order. Uh, this would be equivalent to something you may see at a uh, community street fair or at a special event where there's a food tent, easy up structure with some screening sides. There can be a grill, there can be food produced, and we think we could get a structure like that permitted. The uh, pieces that are required for that purchased or rented and have them on site and were hopefully per permitted uh, by April 22nd when the Little League group is back from their spring break. Uh, we've had the discussions with Alicia Peak and Dane Scophammer, along with Council Member Riggins to go over the ideas and the thoughts to this concept um, this would be something that wasn't exactly planned at the beginning, but in, in order to have uh, a working food snack shack, we believe this would be a path that could work. Uh, as late as this afternoon, uh, Kristen and and Dane walked the property and have uh, we've worked with the building department all today as well to see that we could refloor the existing snack shack structure to use it as storage only remove the pergola, remove the counter, outdoor counter, create space for uh, a food tent structure, use that for service, have a refrigerator and storage area in the snack shack space for the foodstuffs, be able to operate from the tent during the times it's needed, store the rest in the snack shack during the rest of the time. And we do believe that would all be permitted within the rules that LA County Health permits uh, and would provide a safe, uh, option with uh, a three compartment sink, uh, electric grill, all the things that are required from all the different players to have operational food done in a good way and done quickly so that we can make uh, take advantage of the rest of the season. So that's a summary. If there's any questions or thoughts, uh, we do uh, have some confirmation that this seems to be acceptable to the Little League groups. And uh, we're hopeful that if everything seems good, we could uh, begin immediately tomorrow to race to get all the pieces together to make uh, things happen by the 22nd. Thank you. Ron, I just wanted to 
thank you for for your effort you're putting into this and making it happen and thank you also Mary Ann and everybody else who worked on it and the community wants it I'm glad we're going to be able to give it to them I'm gonna have some comments about this during our council member comments anybody else have anything they want to say yeah okay Steve back to you Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That includes that concludes my report, uh, but I'd like to turn to uh, Sergeant Soderlin for a report from the uh, Lost Hills Sheriff's Department, uh, Lost Hills Station from the Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Hi, good evening. It's nice to see everybody. Um, it's been relatively quiet, but I do have uh, three um, events which I'd like to report to you. Um, the first is about a burglary which was solved that happened in Malibu. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Gaudet and Deputy Christie on March 19th, they took a uh, residential burglary report where the victim uh, went into her home and confronted a male Hispanic uh, who was inside. And the Hispanic uh, immediately fled the scene. The uh, victim's sliding door was pried open and some food items were stolen. Uh, the victim was able to provide a photograph of the suspect to the deputies. Uh, fast forward to April 5th, uh, the same deputies, Gaudet and Christie, they responded to a dom domestic violence incident here in Malibu and arrested a male for outstanding warrants. And while they were booking him, they noticed that he was wearing the same clothing that uh, the suspect during the burglary was wearing. So they interrogated the suspect and he admitted to doing that burglary. So uh, the district attorney was able to file um, first degree residential burglary charges against that, that suspect. Um, <clears throat> second item, um, the homeless lady, which was camping in a tent down the street right here at the corner of Cross Creek and PCH has uh, been removed. We got her services. We were able to connect her with uh, her family members in Chicago and she is currently on her way back to Chicago. Uh, the third thing, which happened last week that I was present for, um, Thursday night into Friday, your special assignment deputies that um, are assigned to Malibu, they were conducting parking enforcement along PCH uh, at Zuma Beach, and they found a motorhome which was, had outstanding parking tickets, and it met the threshold to be towed. So they inspected the uh, motorhome, and while they were inspecting it, they smelled a foul odor coming from inside. And so they were able to uh, make entry into the motorhome to make sure that there was nobody in needed medical attention and found uh, five animals suffering from uh, extreme abuse, uh, dogs specifically, they were in cages. There were several deceased dogs as well. And uh, we were able to call the uh, animal control officer who immediately came down and took them to the emergency vet um, clinic to hopefully get them some help. So the suspect ended up showing up about an hour later and she was arrested for felony animal cruelty. So. Those were the main topics for the past several weeks. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? Just thank you for the outstanding work and glad those uh, animals were taken care of. Okay, that concludes um, city manager comments. Great, that takes us to city council. Who would like to go first? We'll go with Steve, then Marianne, and then we'll figure out the rest. Okay, a couple things. Uh, the comment on the mass shootings, I, this, this thing is getting nuts. Uh, I'm not sure how you, you stop it, but somebody's going to have to because this is just going in the wrong direction. Uh, to the folks who came from Malibu West, uh, next, I'm going to send an email to the city manager at, tomorrow morning requesting we do put this on our next agenda. Uh, I'd like to hear from Trevor. I know he's done some work in terms of what's going on, but this, I think you're right. This has been a disaster. Uh, and I think it's right for the city council to take a real serious look and see what we can do to help you folks out. So I will try and get that on the next agenda. We can speak right now about whether we have a consensus to put that on the next agenda or the first agenda right. that the city manager is capable of putting it on. So do we have a consensus for that? Can we hear from Trevor? First of all, about how one goes about how one goes about uh, exiting a a, a gad. Um, sure, it's a, it's a difficult process. The council can't just change its mind to get out of the gad. Um, it'll require, in general, a 
unanimous vote from their board of directors or from 50% of the assessed value in the GAD for um, a dissolution to be possible. The other option, uh, options for dissolution tend to run, uh, revolve around it not operating properly, never collecting assessments or violating the original resolution, um, a material um, part of the original resolution. I haven't heard what that would be. Um, so I don't know if there's anything the council would be able to do in terms of um, dissolving the GAD. Um, but if, if, the, if, if there's more information to be presented or if the council wants to set an item just to have people explain how it would, uh, you know, on what basis they would want to see the GAD um, dissolved, you know, the, the council's ability to set that, um, set that for hearing, but it's a, it's a steep standard in order to be able to um, be able to dissolve that. You can't just do it just because the council is dissatisfied with the manner in which that it's operating. Yeah. All right, so my, my only point in interrupting um, Steve, and I'm sorry for that, is, sure. is this, we, we, can, we can form a consensus here during this period of our uh, meeting to have an agenda item. We can't really get, people can make general comments about the substance, but we, can have a decision to put it on the agenda. Do we have an agreement to do that, or is anybody opposed to that? I'm in favor of it. I would suggest we uh, ask for what our options are and analysis of the current situation uh, from the from those uh, from the current situation to build the options to see what we can do. And we need guidance, obviously, from the city attorney and uh, city staff on it. So it'll be a, to come back with a report on. Um, the status and um, potential options for dissolution or what the requirements for dissolution? Yeah. Miriam? Well, my question would be, you know, do we need to have this be part of a more global solution period um, where we're talking about what sand replenishment looks like at this point? Um, mm -hmm. Or is this strictly an administrative thing with regards to the formation and the possible dissolution of I, I think this the, vehicle. I, I think the answer is we would, that's among the various things right. we would have to have a discussion about. Yeah. The, the GAD I mean, is, I mean, it's, it's a separate organization. It runs, you know, it's not run or controlled by the city council. And I think the item they wanted to bring forward was a potential dissolution. So it can be a report about, you know, the operations of what's happened so far and then what would be required for dissolution. If that, it's what you're looking for. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, the coast, a lot has changed in coastal science over the last decade, and perhaps since there has been a change, that might be part of the discussion. And I don't know, do we need to include Coastal Commission in this? Is they're ultimately the deciders? The, the Coastal Commission would um, be involved in the approval of um, any project that they put forward but they don't have any say, I don't believe, in the formation or the dissolution of the GAD itself. Paul, do you have any objection? Uh, I, I just would advise the members of uh, the, the members of the GAD who would like to depart to get together with the other homeowners who would like to depart, and if we could get them involved, uh, the decision I mean, what we need is 51% of the assessed value inside the GAD to say they want out. And at that point, we can decertify the GAD. But I, we can't let one, as I, based on the research I've conducted, which is slim, we can't let one person out. We need to, and, and, or one property out. We need, there needs to be either the entire board of the GAD votes to go down unanimously or 51% of the assessed value. Owners representing 51% of the assessed value vote to dissolve the GAD. Okay, so Steve McClary, it sounds like we have an agreement that we'd like to get this on the agenda. Um, it was said next meeting, I don't know if that's practical, um, and it maybe there are too many issues that need to be run down before we can have a informed conversation, but we'd like to get it done as soon as practicable. I, I, we think we could get that on for the uh, next regular meeting after the one on the, the two weeks from now. So that would be May 8th. So we'll put that on for the May 8th meeting with the council's concurrence. Great. You got it. Okay. And, and I hadn't said, it, it seems appropriate to me as well. I mean, 
Every single time somebody comes here and asks us to do something, we're not going to put it on the agenda. I just want to make that clear, but we've got a large segment of, yeah, the, of the community that's interested in having this aired, so that's why I'm supporting this. Thank you. Steve, back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, a couple of things I just want to cover. Uh, a couple of meetings. I was in a Malibu facilities meeting uh, earlier this week, and they had to deal with the Santa Monica College uh, opening up, and so everybody saw that presentation, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. Uh, last week, uh, Council Member Stewart and I had an opportunity to do a TV interview with Pepperdine, uh, which was very interesting. Uh, and I just want to mention there are three young ladies that I've worked with over Pepperdine. There's Christiana Buravoska, Lisa Equibus, and Kayla Nia. And I, I mentioned they, these are very smart and, and women. All right? they, I, every time I've worked with them, they, they know what they're doing. They're, they're good to work with. I think they've got great careers ahead of them, so I encourage them to continue what they're doing because I think they're on, on the right path. Uh, we had our Cal Strategies meeting this morning, and I think, Mayor, there's something on the agenda maybe you'll touch base later on with, which I think will be interest to everybody. I received a number of emails from people regarding the Senior Center. Apparently what we've done, we've pulled out the dance floor in the Senior Center, okay? Uh, we've made a fair number of people relatively unhappy in terms of doing that. And I just want to point out, if you look at the demographics of Malibu, there are more seniors than there are kids, right? I mean, the senior population. So I just think maybe when we get to our work meeting on the 20th, whatever it's going to be, we can consider about what we can do to help the seniors get some location back where they can dance. I have a GHAB we just brought up. Uh, dark skies. We did, I think we've now got all the gas stations, the plans from all the gas stations in, in included to, or inputted to the city. Uh, so maybe, maybe not this meeting, but next one, give us some idea of when we think we'll have those plans implemented so we can start dealing with this dark sky stuff because the school district is gonna have these star, stargazing classes and I think we wanna participate in those. Okay, yeah. Good evening. We out of the six uh, gas stations, five of them are under plan check. Uh, four of them um, are finalizing their last correction list. So everything is on the hands of the uh, gas station owners and designers. We are contacting them uh, tomorrow to try to push for the uh, resubmittal of those correction lists. Okay. Uh, but we're very, very close. Um, the one that we have permits and has been um, completed with the installation is the Chevron at 2367 uh, uh, PCH. We are coordinating the last uh, final construction inspection to finalize that. In addition, uh, for the shopping centers, on April 18, uh, the consultants and city staff will be doing a one by one inspection to provide the shopping center owners with complete information and also an assessment, uh, a general assessment of the lighting so we can get those 100% compliance also. We're trying to do every effort to get everybody into compliance and I know it has been a long road for the gas stations the last gas station that just got up, uh, approved by the planning department is 29145 Heathercliff. It went in through plan check uh, last Friday. All right, Yolanda, thank you very much. You're welcome. That, that's, the last one was a big one. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, two other things. Uh, I got a bunch of emails this week with signs regarding people using Roundup up on Point Doom in the Nature Center up there. Now, I don't know who the heck these people are. We ought to find out and figure out how we get rid of them. I mean, this is nuts. You put that roundup up there, it, it, you know, it, it's dangerous to the environment. It, when it rains, it rolls into the ocean. So this is, I don't know who the heck decided to do this. I got some email back from Darlene, I guess, and she, or I think it was Darlene, from State Parks with some explanation that didn't make any sense at all of why we're using roundup. So we ought to figure, you know, this is, I got Yolanda, we saw the presentation earlier. They're busting their chops over there trying to improve the environment here in our city. And I got state parks using Roundup 
on the other side of that. So I don't know who, who talks to state parks, but if we got somebody there, I'm going to try and give them a call. But somebody from the city may want to just you know, yank their chain a little bit and say, what the heck are you guys doing? And then finally, I got a call this yesterday or this morning. Apparently, the, the uh, holding pond over on Legacy Park, we're starting to drain that for the summer. That's what I, okay. And the, the reason I got a call, apparently some people have dumped some domestic ducks in that pond, all right? <laughs> And they can't fly. I mean, they love the water, but if, if they drain the parks, these ducks are going to be in, in deep trouble. So maybe if we're going to drain it, we call somebody from the wildlife center or somebody to come in and maybe capture those ducks and just prevent them from getting eaten by some coyotes or something somewhere, somewhere down the line. All right, Mayor, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Marianne? I don't know if I can follow ducks. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, thank Chris. Uh, for his uh, information on PCH and the suggestions that they had there. Perhaps that's something that public safety, we can talk about um, trying to find um, some partnership to do those sorts of things. Um, also, with the, uh, the beacon boxes, I've seen they've all been installed. Maybe if we can get a pre presentation similar to what building or uh, environmental sustainability is doing with regards to the beacon boxes, what they're used for, and some outreach to maybe some of the other, either media or something to alert the other firefighters that might be called into our area so at least they know what they are so they don't get unused um, when we do move forward. I wanted to thank the representatives of the Malibu West neighborhood. I hear you. Uh, we're going to start looking into what can be done, but yeah, I agree with Paul. Reach out to the other members of that and maybe get a coalition together. I'm sure there's some homeowners uh, additionally. Um, I attended Chumash Day. I had a wonderful time. It was a great event. I want to thank Community Services. They went above and beyond and uh, just had an outstanding event. Everybody was so happy with that, and they had to pivot for some changes, but they did a great job on that. Um, I also attended the Library Speaker Series at Pepperdine and introduced uh, Dr. Britt Ray and Heard some good information about uh, people's reaction to climate change, how it's affecting their lives, and some suggestions how people can um, look at, at reducing some of their anxiety levels. So I thought that was a really great presentation. Um, I also read the letter from Shelley Kramer. It's my understanding that staff uh, community services was also able to work with the seniors and try and come up with a solution to help out with that project. So uh, hopefully we'll have them re-dancing uh, as soon as possible. Um, let's see. I have been working with Rob and Kristen, Kate, Yolanda, and her team uh, with regards to the um, possible changes to the temporary snack shack. Um, I think the, the tent has come up with a good solution. It's something that we can get permitted uh, through the county um, where the trailer was going to be causing additional approvals um, and additional things for the staff and or the community to have to work through. So I think um, what they've all come up with is a good solution and um, I think it's something that we can at least get the community so we can start serving seeing hot dogs and hamburgers and other cooked food out there at, at Bluffs Park uh, for the remainder of the baseball season. Um, hopefully we'll have that up uh, early May at the latest. So that was great, and I want to thank everybody for doing that. Um, I did have some questions uh, for Tim from MRCA. Um, I did not see similar experiences. Maybe, you know, given the weather that we had on Sunday, this last, that... There weren't as many visitors, but uh, last weekend uh, that coincided with Chumash Days, the amount of people at the Winding Way Trailhead, um, I heard there were at least two rescues out there on that particular weekend uh, for people that were having issues. It was absolutely overwhelmed with people visiting that particular trailhead, and I'm sure having an incredible impact on that neighborhood. So. I would like to see MRCA step up their um, presence um, in that area in the coming weeks. I don't know what we can do to request that, but it's 
absolutely out of control out there, and um, we need to make sure that they are aware of it and they're taking care to make sure that all the visitors that are coming to see all the beautiful areas in Malibu um, have what they need to lessen the impact on our residents in their private neighborhoods uh, while still allowing the public enjoyment of the beautiful public lands. And I think that's all I've got. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. Paul and Doug, who would like to go next? Paul. Okay. Uh, been in a, a busier than I thought it was going to be two weeks. Uh, two days after the uh, last city council meeting, I went down to ALADS in uh, Monterey Park, which is Association of Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs. And the speakers that day were Chief, were Sheriff Luna and our Chief Maroney and, uh, of the fire department. And Maroney, as many of you know, actually uh, was based very closely here in Malibu. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to both of them and Chief Maroney knows an awful lot of people in this town. And so we had a very nice chat. And Sheriff Luna is uh, a breath of fresh air. I think that the, uh, the, the deputies I've talked to are very, very happy that he's in charge. And I'm hoping that uh, that, that continues and that the uh, we just need to graduate a lot of academy classes and get you some uh, some relief from the excessive overtime you guys are all working. Uh, the other things, I, I also went to the Chumash Day, and I think uh, Bruce did a great job at carrying the flag out there and dancing, and that was that was good. I'm glad that he did that, and uh, it was a good time. I'm sure we all enjoyed that, and the people who were there certainly enjoyed it. And I also joined several other people uh, at Pepperdine to hear the uh, library speaker talking about getting over the pandemic depression. So uh, my advice is get up, go to work, make something different happen. And that's, uh, that's it for me. Doug, you're on. Thank okay. you, Paul. By the way, if anybody's got a video of the mayor dancing at the Chumash, that's worth that's that's going to be somebody's retirement fund right there. <laughs> All right, I didn't I'll, know I was I'll dancing. Uh, to the Malibu West uh, people, thank you very much for coming. I, you present a very compelling case for us to be active and address this issue. And as I said, um, in when we're talking about putting this on the agenda. We need to have a good analysis of what's taking place, uh, see what our options are, and start moving forward. One thing that I will mention is it's very apparent that the Malibu West uh, neighborhood is very active on this, but there's a lot more uh, constituents in that uh, association or assessment district, and we need to make sure they're heard from and, and they have their involvement as well. And I see a head shaking or two out there on that. So uh, please make sure that we've got a broad uh, coalition of this so we can get something done. Um, Chris Wisdom, you're absolutely right. I heard you at the Business Roundtable on a Friday talk about your incident on PCH. Um, hopefully when we get the Sheriff's substation in place, and I think some of the ideas that you had are all starting to gel together. I'll make a comment as well that I believe the state of California is looking at uh, speed cameras again and a few test sites around the state. Uh, hopefully Malibu can be considered for at least that. Uh, Right now, we've got people who actually run by our uh, speed signs and take pictures to show how fast they're going. Well, maybe we can turn it the other way around. We'll take a picture to see how fast they're going and make it worth our while. Uh, Arts Commission and Parks, you guys are spot on. If you look back at the Parks uh, Plan, I think it was 2011, 2012, um, it talked about all the things we were going to do for the parks in the city. Your uh, community center, arts center idea is right on line with that. I think on the agenda when we start talking about the things we're going to focus on this next year, and I've talked about this when I was running for this office as well, we need to have a master plan for our parks and our community center and not talk about it anymore, start putting it in place. The city has the money to make this stuff happen. We just need to get the plan together, get the consensus, and put get it started. It's going to have to be in phases, but let's get it started. So we'll talk about that when we get together on the uh, master plan for the city. Um, I think we had a good holiday weekend this last weekend. I know the um, 
uh, public safety group was talking about all the things that they were going to be doing to try and prepare for big crowds. I'll say, luckily, the weather was different here on the coast than it was in the valleys and in inland, to the degrees of about 25 degrees. But I drove by Winding Way on, on Sunday, and it was unbelievable. And I, I know you people have heard me make this comment about a sign that, that the National Parks has in the Smoky Mountains. It says, if this parking lot is full, so is the park. Please come back tomorrow. MRCA and the other people that are running this park area up to Escondido Falls has got to put some control in there and tell people it's full. It's too many people. The rescues, people falling all over each other, not to mention the impact on the environment. I mean, we... We're loving some of these areas to death. I know you talked about the tide pool down at Point Doom. This is ridiculous. We're killing what we're supposed to be protecting. And there's nothing going to be to look at after we've stepped it to death. So MRCA, Ranger Tim, hopefully you pass that message along. Um, Snack Shack. I cannot tell you how appreciative I think we all are about what you guys pulled together, especially Mary Ann and the staff. Uh, this was... Uh, I'll call it a key point for the community. If we can't get this done, we can't do anything. So thank you for getting this part done. Let's see if we can't make it permanent with something better. Um, I hate the fact that uh, the health department wants to protect ourselves from ourselves, but I guess that's the case today. Um, I uh, also continue to meet with residents around the city about easement issues. We'll leave it at that. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Councilman uh, Uring and I uh, were on the Pepperdine TV station. They've got quite a facility over there, and those people at Pepperdine put on a very professional program. It was impressive. Uh, we're lucky to have them in the neighborhood. And I also did an interview for the local newspaper over there. Met with Senator Ben Allen uh, at, with the uh, Council of Governments. They had a sort of an informal luncheon over at Westlake with him. A great addition to our support group here. Um, he is very much involved in Malibu and the interest in it. He, along with Jackie Irwin, make a great team for us, and you'll see something later on in the agenda for Jackie Irwin that we need to have, and just a wonderful set of representatives for ourselves. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, just would like to know when we're going to see the Baker Tilly report on the planning department, and uh, love to see the information on the Serif substation um, uh, proposals on their cost st studies. I know Paul and I are on a subcommittee for that. Love to see when we're going to do on it so we can get that committed and we can start seeing somebody, some sergeant in here all the time. All right. With that, that's all I have. Thank you, Doug. Okay. For my part, it has been a busy two weeks as well. Um, I'm going to start with the, I want to thank the public speakers today as well as many, many residents who submitted written comments. Um, I read them all and um, I mean, they were largely about the same thing that most of the speakers tonight, in fact, almost every speaker tonight, it's this G-H-A-D, pronounced GAD. By the way, I, I know that a lot of people are trying to be humorous and calling it a jihad, but th that is an Islamic holy war, and I don't think we should make fun of that. Um, it's, it's a GAD, and um, it's, it's on the agenda now. We'll deal with that. Um, and as someone else said, I don't remember which person, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of constituents that we haven't heard from. There's a lot of information we don't have. This is brand new to me. I, I didn't know anything about it. So we're, we're going to have to learn about it and see what, if anything, can be done or should be done. The um, Snack Shack. Um, I, when I first learned that we were going to not be able to do what the city council directed be done, the um, temporary trailer, in which we authorized the expenditure of over $100,000, I, I was not at all happy to hear that. I am pleased to hear that a solution has been fashioned nonetheless. Um, you know, I'm about trying to find solutions. I, I read the analysis of why we can't do the um, temporary trailer, trying to find reasons that that was not correct and that we can. Um, but I, I, I think we came up against a wall there. So I think it was a great decision to pivot and move to this um, tent. Um, do we need somehow to give a formal approval of doing it that way because we did have a meeting and an agenda item and a, a unanimous vote to do a certain thing, and now we're doing something different? Do, should we, as a matter of formality, button that down and, and approve, at least even retroactively if necessary, this at the next meeting? I, I don't believe that we need any action at this point. I believe we've got enough um, broad direction from the council to move forward. Uh, but obviously, if there was any concern this evening, we we could put a hard stop and uh, and, and bring the item back. 
Okay. Okay. Um, and, and we're going to have a discussion at the next meeting about um, how to inter whether and how to interpret the LCP. Um, I met with uh, met with um, members of the Malibu Film Society about trying to find a solution for them and finding a home in Malibu. Um, Paul and I have been working on that together. Um, I also um, last weekend or it was during the week, Monday, met with the board of directors by Zoom. And I think we have a possible solution that Paul and I are going to be presenting at a future meeting. Um, there's, there's some details that need to be worked out, but I think we're at least subject to other council members joining us. We may have a solution that will work for everybody. Um, I attended the Shumash Day last weekend. Um, I didn't realize I was dancing. I thought I was just marching with everyone else, but who knows? I'd like to see the, the recording, too, if someone has one. Uh, but I was, I was honored to be able to say a few words and to be able to carry the flag. And we, I, I think we need to find more um, room in Malibu for the, for the Shumash, something, you know, we talk about a, an arts center, a performing arts center. I think we need some kind of component that acknowledges the Shumash as well. Um, last Friday, this past Friday, I, I attended a dinner at the um, mayor's mansion in, um, in Los Angeles, um, mayor, where Mayor Bass lives. Um, was invited there by Supervisor Horvath. The mayors of all of the um, cities that are in um, Supervisor Horvath's district were there. Um, we had a very good discussion at dinner. Um, it focused mainly on the issue of unhoused um, people in the various cities, Los Angeles obviously having a far more serious issue than we do. Um, I commented at the dinner that um, the unhoused population in Malibu is not, for the most part, from Malibu. I mean, you can count on one hand if there's any um, unhoused people living in Malibu who are from Malibu. Somebody lost their home, somebody lost an apartment, and was living here, and, and can't live there anymore. Um, I, that for the most part, they've traveled here from other places. So it's, it's a lot different than other cities. Um, Mayor Bass expressed surprise with that statement. She asked me where they were coming from, and I, I told her they're, they come from Los Angeles. They come from unincorporated Los Angeles County. They come from other parts of California, and as we heard tonight, and I said that, they even come from other states. Um, Mayor Bass said she was very surprised to hear that because she says that she has traveled around Los Angeles, and for the most part, as far as she could tell, the people in Los Angeles that are living on the street lived a few blocks away from where they're living on the street. So we have a we have a very different um, situation here, and um, I think we, we need to find different solutions than, than Los Angeles is looking for in other places. Uh, in my view, it's and we'll talk about this more later. It's 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 not the responsibility of the city of Malibu to pick up the slack for other cities who are falling down on the job. Um, speaking of Supervisor Horvath, um, also. There's been mixed reviews publicly about um, how she's doing for the city of Malibu. I have to say, last Sunday, she called me on a, on a Sunday afternoon. We spoke for over an hour about Camp Kilpatrick um, on her Sunday afternoon. And um, I have confidence that she's actually trying for our city to do something about the fact that the state is insisting that they, I'm sorry, the, the Board of Supervisors actually is insisting that they move more dangerous um, youthful offenders into that facility. It's going to happen, at least temporarily. Whether it's going to happen permanently or not remains to be seen. Uh, I believe she's on our side, but she's the most junior member of the board. She's one of five people, and, the, and as I know personally from my experience on city council, um, a, a dissenting member can't accomplish a hell of a lot. But um, I do believe she's trying. She certainly is listening to us, and um, I think it'd be great for people to show some support for her because she's she's trying to support us. Um, let's see. Those are pretty much most of my comments. I just want to say also, just lastly, last week we closed, we adjourned in honor, in memory of the um, six victims of the Nashville shooting. Um, and I have to say, I was I was super offended to see the Nashville the, the, the Tennessee legislature removing members of their body simply because they spoke out against gun violence in in Tennessee. Um, at best, it was ignorant. At worst, it was racist. And um, I certainly hope we never see anything like that here. That's it. That takes us to the consent calendar. Uh, I know that we have one member of the public that wants to pull number five. 
Are there any others that are being pulled? If there are any members of the public who'd like to speak on the consent calendar, we'd ask you to raise your hand. We don't have any in-person speaker slips. And we do have one individual raising their hand, so we'll confirm which item they'd like to pull. Sorry. Nicole, you should see a pop-up. Would you like to pull item number 3B5? Yes, please. And we have one other raised hand from Lonnie Gordon. Lonnie, please let us know which item you would like to pull. Lonnie, you should see a pop-up, ask you to unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry to make you wait. I had to get my audio back on. Um, I was going to speak on item number five. If we pull it, what does that mean exactly? That means you'll have the opportunity to speak on it. So just give us okay, one moment. Then, then, thank you. Okay. Um, before we continue, I had neglected. Marianne had signaled to me that she had some further comments So um, on city council comments. So go ahead. The only item I was going to was on the, the point doom headlands. I know that there's been a group of volunteers from both the neighborhood and, and others in the community that have gone out there and done some trail work and some pulling some weeds. Um, so if state parks need some help with volunteers pulling those weeds instead of using Roundup, uh, they just need to reach out to us and we'll put our gloves on and we'll get out there and we'll certainly get some of those invasive species out of there. So. Um, with regards to the agenda, I'd like to abstain from 3B3 and pull 3B9, please. Okay. Does anybody else wish to pull any other items? I need to abstain on 3B3 as well. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion that we approve the um, consent calendar with the exception of 3B5 and 3B9 and with a note that um, Doug and Marianne are abstaining from 3B3. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on that? I guess that, that's kind of silly. There wouldn't be any. Let's have a roll call, please. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so 3B5 would be the first item that's been pulled. We're unmuting the speakers for that item. Nicole, we can hear you. Hello. Okay, so I will come back. Hello all again. Thank you and I apologize once again for getting that wrong earlier. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit just so I can give reference again uh, as far as uh, having worked with Malibu for Safe Tech, Lonnie Gordon and a, a, a large group of folks um, with the legal guidance of Scott McCullough on the wireless ordinance. Um, so in this related item of the extension for the telecom consultant CMS, um, CMS has provided valuable assistance to the city and our residents, and there's absolutely no reason to think about changing. We 100% support this extension, but we don't understand why it's only for a few months instead of the full two years. And there wouldn't be a reason to seek proposals for the other firms. And what I was listing before was the Malibu Municipal Code sections 2.56.060.g and 2.561, excuse me, 56.130.b.3 allow you to simply extend rather than go through an RFP process again. Um, we also believe that CMS should be used for more. The staff is understaffed and referring materials to CMS would allow the staff to tend to other matters since the applicant pays the costs and there isn't an impact on the budget. This is especially so at the front end because every application should go directly to CMS and they should be the ones that make the initial determination whether applications are complete and then whether the proposal is properly categorized by type. This is important because there are many recent applications in or near residential areas that we want to be especially sure those are properly analyzed. CMS has no ties with telecom and signs promises to remain financially independent. They don't work on both sides, 
Unlike the prior consultant who we found reviewed applications, but also negotiated leases for private parties for sites that needed permits. They even gave courses to the wireless on how to get permits approved, uh, one of which I audited. We thoroughly investigated various consultants and were very happy to find CMS during the last RFP go around. So just to reiterate, I completely support this extension, but I would also encourage council to extend further than the three months to the two years. Um, thank you very much for your time and all that you're doing for our beautiful community. And um, we will be talking soon. Thank you, Nicole. Next, we'll hear from Lonnie Gordon. Lonnie, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you fine. Good. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. And for the new Council Members who do not know me, I'm the Executive Director of Malibu for SafeTech.org. And I'm speaking to, obviously, Item 3B5 and uh, the Center for Municipal Solutions. I receive online monthly pending project reports and they indicate that the wireless companies are coming in with many new applications for projects in and near residential areas, a lot in the residential areas. It's more important than ever that we get these right. Malibu for Safe Tech and our professional consultants vetted several companies, as Nicole mentioned, and we found the best company for, for Malibu. Um, many of the new applications in residential areas claim to be for exempt facilities. We have some doubt that several of those do not meet the criteria for exempt facilities, and there may be some question on the RF reports and compliance with safety codes. The city really needs CMS more than ever because they've the neutral expertise to properly analyze applications by type, and they can also verify the RF compliance statements. The residents haven't always agreed with some CMS findings and recommendations in past cases, but we do think they have the right talents and we trust that they're independent and acting in good faith. You have the right consultants and you should keep them. Although we, we do support the extension, we say it should be two full years, not just a few months. Thank you so much for your consideration and what you do. Good night. Thank you, Lonnie. So that takes us, that, that closed co public comment? Yes, it does. Okay, takes us back to council. Is there any discussion on item 3B3? I'm sorry, five. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, adopt 3B5 and perform the recommended action. I'll second. I just have one question of staff, whoever is responsible for this one. Could you answer um, Nicole's question about why this is a three month extension rather than a fuller one? Mayor and members of the City Council, um, the Planning Department issued an RFP. Uh, the contract expires. Um, so in order to extend the term of the existing contract, they're asking for that short-term extension, and then they'll complete the RFP for potentially a new or the same vendor there as they complete that process. Okay. And will that be the type of um, RFP that we review for quality, or is it simply the lowest bidder? Quality. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uri? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 3B9. Um, did somebody on council pull that? Here we am. Yeah. Do you want to report or do you want to just speak? Um, I just had some clarifying questions. Um, so I guess I'm a little concerned. I don't know if I was doing my math correct on um, what the settlement amounts would be to Malibu. Um, from the way I was calculating, it looked like it could be several hundred thousand per year and possibly eventually millions. I understand um, 
that we may not have the bandwidth or the ability to put those to select projects. But that seems like an awful lot of money to be allowing the county to be um, allocated and just want to make sure that we're getting our proper credit for that amount of money. And if we're getting in-kind in services back, if that can be allocated for specific projects that we're seeing from either homelessness or other impacts from the opioid crisis, just to make sure that we're just not turning over all this money to the county and not getting anything in return for the possible hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that this could amount to. Well, maybe we can let Trevor address that, but I'll tell you, I, I had the same issue the last go around. I don't remember if it was the same settlement or a different settlement, but we're, we're not getting an allocation from the county if we opt in. We're just letting the county have our money is my understanding. So um, maybe you could explain that. Sure. That's correct. So this is generated from these nationwide opioid uh, litigation that's been ongoing. And these settlement agreements have been, you know, we had a tranche of them come in last year. These are a, a new tranche of uh, the defense had chosen to settle. And the amount that's allocated is depending on participation levels within each particular state. And it is nowhere near the, uh, the amount that, um, that, that uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. I think that uh, Malibu's allocation, do you know what it was last time, Steve? I, I want to say it's 20, 30,000 something in, in that range, and this is anticipated to be less. I don't have the exact calculations of how they break it out. It's very a very complicated formula, and they haven't provided the exact amount that the city would receive. But for that amount of money, it's um, we don't have the programs. It only can be used for specific opioid um, specific uses um, and programs and there's a lot of documentation that has to be filed annually the county does have programs that qualify for this and since they're doing it for all these other um, jurisdictions the paperwork is worth it for them to be able to do it so the recommendation is that, that we do participate if we don't it's sort of like those class action lawsuit mailers that you'll get in the mail that you either participate or you don't um, the city is unlikely to be you know launching this litigation like as you said there so it's sort of we either agree to take it on or, or we don't. Um, if, if you want to, you know, give direction that if the city has programs that qualify, that, that we can look into that um, and, and, and and report back if you want. But um, I don't think that it's generally worth the burden for the city to um, participate in the annual reporting requirements to keep the funds for ourselves. And it's just not worth it for the amount. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I mean, when you look at the appendix and you see that Malibu's share is 0.002%. Doesn't sound like much, but when you multiply that against $3 billion, it comes to some substantial money if I'm doing my math right. Well, if we get it, when it's calculated out, we can uh, report back if it's over $30,000, we can report back and then the, the council can change its direction. We don't need to allocate that money to the county. But I do recommend that we do participate um, in, in the program. Okay. Like I said, my biggest concern is just making sure that we're getting credit from the county of these funds and that we have as m the possibility of those being used in Malibu and or at least something. I, I understand what you're saying about um, the amount of reporting and recording and everything else on that, so. Okay, I'll say we're, we're, we're not going to get any credit from the county. Um, when this came up the last time around, I think I may have been the sole member of the council that dissented. Uh, my feeling was um, if we opt in, we give money to the county and we get nothing. If we don't opt in, um, we may never get anything, but we're getting nothing now. But there could yet be another settlement for the non-opt-ins as a, as a subclass, and it could be larger, and it could come to Malibu. And I didn't see any be benefit to opting into something that provides you with zero, but you give a release, whereas not opting in provides the potential, however small the potential might be, for a future recovery. Uh, but the council, in its infinite wisdom, outvoted me on that one last time around. And I suspect that may happen again. Well, can I ask a clarifying question on that? I mean, would that require us putting forth our own lawsuit? And No. Okay. We could do nothing 
and in which case if no one else does not, if everyone else does nothing there will never be anything except the county won't get our money and if we do nothing and someone else does something and there's a further subclass and a recovery or another settlement we may end up getting something well uh, it seems to me that I remember and I could easily be wrong that the the problem is that if we take the money we have to have programs to use it on and account for it and so between setting up the program uh, we're, we're fortunate to not have a large number of people with opioid problems in Malibu thank God uh, and if people are going to get served in the county of Los Angeles that's probably a win-win for us uh, if people need to go into a county facility to get served that's better than them coming here and asking where's the facility so I'm uh, I may be misunderstanding this but as I recall the total dollars at stake and the other thing were way less than the cost we would have had to administer the program but I, I, I did not man, uh, multiply it out for this one let me put it that way any further discussion uh, I did uh, take the numbers out and I think it is around twenty thousand dollars but that's if everybody gets the maximum money there's usually a formula in these things where if people don't use the money or can't allocate it properly the big dollar amount the billions of dollars shrinks quickly and um, honestly I, I think this is as Paul said it's probably better to let the county have it get some benefit out of it and as um, uh, the mayor was saying a few minutes ago our homeless people and usually addiction has got something to do with it or from somewhere else and if the county can put a program in that interdicts with them before they get to Malibu we're better off um, in terms of best uses of our resources it'd be great if somebody would hand us a bunch of money but I don't think we're going to see it so I, I would prefer that we just go ahead and accept the uh, settlement and move on to something else do you want to make a motion Doug I'll make a motion to approve I'll second a motion is there any further discussion okay can we have a roll call please Councilmember Stewart yes Councilmember Grisanti yes. Councilmember Riggins Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? No. Motion carries. Okay, that ends the consent calendar. Um, I'm content to move on. Does anybody wish to take a break before we move to item four? No? Okay, so item four is adoption of ordinance number 504, Los Angeles County Fire Code. Um, remote participants, please raise your hand on Zoom. In Zoom, if you would like to speak on this item, and you'll be called after the staff report. I have no sign-ups from anybody at this moment. Are there any? We don't have any in-person speaker sign-ups for this item. Okay, so can we have a staff report, please, followed by any Zoom comments? Good evening, City Council. Uh, this evening, uh, we bring to you our conducting a public hearing and the second reading for the adoption of Ordinance 504, Los Angeles County Fire Code. Uh, this was presented to you a month ago. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. If I remember correctly, this was the one that this is a ministerial act that we're required to do by law. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment on Zoom? No, we don't have any remote participants to speak on this item. Okay. Is there anybody on council who has a comment to make? I'll make a motion to adopt item 4A. I'll second. I think, uh, do we open and close the public hearing? Excuse me? Do we open and close the public hearing? Oh. Yes, we don't have any public speakers in person or on Zoom who'd like to speak on this item. Okay. Thank you. So that'll close public comment. And we now have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? There being no discussion, let's have a roll call, please. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, pursuant to the motion made on the agenda, we are going to take up item 6D first for the item 6 matters. Um, before we begin that, I would like to propose, if council will agree, um, that after we hear report and public comment on this one, 
that the council members not comment on this and that we then um, agree to adjourn this um, to a future date so that we can have a closed session meeting to discuss legal issues that are implicated by this item because there are possibilities of bringing litigation, there are possibilities of being sued, and I believe the City Council ought to um, have a full um, vetting behind closed doors as, as is permitted of the legal issues before we make a decision as to the proper way to proceed. So, um, Steve. So the question is how fast can we get a closed session? I mean, this has been dragging on for a long time, so. Well, the, the, I, the motion I'm, I'll make will be that we have it um, th this week, Marianne and I are going to be at a conference in Sacramento, but that we have it next week prior to the next meeting. Cool. So uh, I don't know, Trevor, do we need to have a, for a motion and a vote on us holding off on our comments or just we'll decide that once we get If you want to make comment. a motion to continue the item to a date certain, you could do that. But I want to, I want to let the, the staff report go and, and have public comment. Then you can uh, hold the public comment and the staff report and then make the motion at that point. Okay. So well, let's do actually, that. Actually, we, we, I mean, we should allow public comment if we're going to allow the staff report. If you don't want to continue without hearing the item, if you want to allow that, then you should allow public comment and then make the motion. So staff report, public comment, and then I can make a formal motion? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are you getting that report? Oh, Richard. It's okay. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, I'm here this evening to propose or to present to you a proposed code amendments to both our local coastal program and Malibu Municipal Code to address um, fractional ownership, co-ownership, but timeshare type uses. As I mentioned, the purpose of tonight's item is to initiate amendments that staff would then work on drafting the ordinances in response to that, present it to ZOE races, and then take those uh, recommendations from ZOE races to the Planning Commission and then back to this body for adoption. The specific goal of this is to address fractional ownership and co-ownership of timeshare type homes. This is a purchasing mechanism, or excuse me, a, a, a operation by which each buyer acquires a share of a given property. The purpose of these amendments is for the preservation of housing stock and to address some of the concerns raised by both the citizens and the Planning Commission and City Council when uh, staff works on the city's housing element to aid in enforcement methods of should these be found within our city. And then the final uh, purpose of the amendments that we're proposing, of course, would be to create a detailed prohibition on the timeshare use and specifically identify it, as I mentioned, which would aid our enforcement in addressing these. I'm available for any questions as well as the city attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so for public comment, uh, we have first I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly, Pervy Dashi from Picasso, then Joe Drummond, followed by Lloyd Ahern, although I don't see Lloyd in the room anymore. Pervy, you're first. It's not on. Oh, Lloyd's still on. Okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. My name is Porvi Doshi, and I'm a Senior Public Affairs Manager for Picasso, a real estate and property management company. I ask that the city consider meeting with Picasso prior to moving ahead with any policy decisions on co-ownership tonight. We understand there are community concerns to address, and we take those very seriously. We believe that there are ways to work together on developing policies that help address those concerns while also protecting the ability to co-own a home. While the staff report provides an interpretation of our business model, Picasso is not a timeshare. It is co-ownership, which is common practice that's been around for generations. Picasso has simply modernized this process by reducing the hassles that come with owning a second home. We consolidate an average of six buyers into one home 
aggregating demand and preserving more homes for full-time residents. After the home is fully sold, Picasso retains zero ownership and stays on as the property manager, taking care of repairs, maintenance, managing utility bills, and other needs. Our owners agree to and abide by a set of home policies, which include, but are not limited to, complying with local laws around trash, noise, and parking. The owners are not allowed to rent out the home. Short-term rentals are prohibited. Additionally, there is a local home manager available for any issues that might arise and to ensure that our home policies are being adhered to. With co-ownership, there is a higher utilization of the property and more contributions to local taxes than traditional second homes. Our owners have made a large, finan large financial investment into their property and treat it with the care and respect to the community you would expect of a homeowner. Of the 10,000 residential units in Malibu, 31% are held in an LLC or trust, which already allow for multiple owner arrangements. Therefore, the city needs to consider the unintended consequences of imposing limitations on about one third of its existing housing stock. In addition, 38% of Malibu homes are non-owner occupied, which means they either sit empty for most of the year or are utilized for rental income. Picasso's model helps ensure homes don't sit empty and neighbor neighborhoods continue to feel like neighborhoods. Of the 10,000 residential units in the city, 10 homes are co-owned under the Picasso ownership model. We are not subject, so we are not subject to the same concerns the council recently expressed about the number of short-term rentals in the city. We respectfully ask the council consider working with us on developing regulations to solve your concerns on co-owned homes while still allowing this more sustainable, efficient, and inclusive approach to second home ownership. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions on, on the model if the council has any. Thank you, Porvi. Sorry for Thank mispronouncing you. your name. No worries. Thank you. Joe Drummond. Yeah, I know I saw. Honorable Mayor Silverstein and City Council, on February 24th of last year, I sent an in information via email to the City Council regarding many other cities in California fighting against Picasso in their own cities at that time. Sonoma created an emergency ordinance, and just recently Carmel is enforcing their own already in existence ordinance in prohibiting timeshares. Malibu is unique in that we last in that we lost many families after the Woolsey fire and also due to its rising housing stock prices. Picasso timeshares need ongoing enforcement and to be stopped with their inflated prices for single family homes of up to four times their actual value. I've seen homes valued from at three to five million dollars from going from 900,000 to 2.4 million for a one eighth share. That's almost 20 million dollars for a regular family house. This makes homes obviously less affordable for regular full-time residents and the existing timeshare laws need to be enforced and they need to be removed from the Malibu marketplace. They also can stay at a minimum of only one week at a time per year apparently during their 44 days. That we have already had this code in our MMC and not enforced in over a year is honestly not very responsible but the City Council must put enforcement details on tonight. I understand that Picasso can make it difficult to enforce, which is why we are here tonight and why the city of Carmel and others have recently completed similar items. Basically, they have stated that a house cannot be co-owned under a contractual agreement that lays out certain parameters for when owners can and cannot stay in a year. But if a group of people simply wanted to go in on a house, they could. And they, have, and they all have a right to visit and the responsibility of taking care of that home year round. That is the subdivision and legal assignment of rights to exclusive use that must be prohibited. Earlier today, Bill Sampson reiterated that Picasso barely disguised up zoning and is also subdividing with no compliance with the Subdivision Act nor the Subdivision Math Act. The investment perspective doesn't have the disclosure that the use is not a guaranteed right. It is not allowed, it's prohibited. They are also taking off the market affordable homes. It needs proper policy interpretation and code enforcement. So please ensure the ordinance is interpreted clearly and enforceable so that Picasso is made to cease and desist all operations in Malibu. They are basically unregulated vacation rental hotels that do not even contribute anything to total occupancy taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Lloyd, you're up. I didn't know this young lady was going to be here, and 
what she said is what they say in the contract, and then there's life. And the life is, I live next door to one. So what you just heard from her was a myth, okay? The, the other thing, this is a Trevor question. In your staff report, you mention all the bad things that go wrong with having, you know, taking, having eight people live in one house and losing the neighborhood. But also, we're losing a house that could have three kids in a school, and we're dying to get kids in a school. So instead of going to talk about what I was going to talk about, I'm going to let you guys figure this out. But am I pointing at the right person? A myth. I live next door to a myth. Thank you, Lloyd. Do we have Zoom comments? Yes, you do. You have four people on Zoom. Uh, first, we will hear from Jordan Must. Jordan, you are unmuted. Okay, great. Do we have video or is it audio only? Audio only. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are Picasso owners who actually happen to be in Malibu at this exact moment. Funny timing. And uh, as people have talked about, these are not certainly not considered to be any type of Airbnb or short term rentals. I'm sitting here with my wife and our two kids are asleep downstairs. And this is a property that we bought that was pre previously vacant. The prior owner had it as a second home was hardly ever in the community. And we are here multiple times a year building memories. We're shopping in the local places. We went to vintage grocers today and ate at the brewery. And every time we come here, we eat at a new place like Boo Sushi, for example. So I'm not really sure it also takes away from the affordable housing stock. I'm sure the council has looked at some of the purchase prices of these properties. These are other trophy second home type destinations that Malibu has a ton of that just sit unfortunately vacant throughout the year because somebody bought them as their fifth or sixth or seventh property. And if anything, it really makes the community a little bit more vibrant I'm sure the idea behind Malibu, of course, is to have people shopping in restaurants and uh, attending the local events and festivals and things like that. And I'm, I'm sure people have brought up before, having numerous empty second, third, fifth homes is not really great for the community either. So these are not rowdy vacation rentals. We're a quiet family that's here in about two, two and a half months a year. So I don't think that's really the most fair example in the world. Um, I think that's about it. So we've been very happy with the model so far. The homes are incredibly well taken care of. We've enjoyed interacting with the other owners. And whether we did this with Picasso or, as we said, we bought it with a bunch of friends, it's the same impact on the community whatsoever. And again, if you look at the Picasso model, these are not the affordable properties that are coming off the market because that's not what people look at for second homes. So I don't think that's exactly the best example either. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. Who's next? Next, we'll hear from Sid Hirsch. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Okay, uh, thank you. Honorable Mayor and City Council members, thank you for this time to speak. My name is Sid Hirsch, and my husband Andrew and I are share owners of a Picasso home on Broad Beach Road. Malibu, just to give you a little background on my history with it, has been a part of my life since I was a little girl. I grew up in the Valley and every summer we would rent beach houses in Malibu from June until September. And a house that we ended up renting year over year was on Broad Beach Road. It's really not too far from the house that we are currently uh, owners in right now. That house, sadly, it burnt down in the 1978 fire um, but Malibu's always been in my heart. So Broad Beach is a very special place to me. When my husband and I saw that there was a home available through Picasso on Broad Beach, we jumped at the opportunity to see it and then purchase it. I was hoping to create the exact same wonderful memories of this incredible city that I shared with my family. And we've been owners for just over a year now, 
and it's been fantastic. We are at this house to relax, enjoy meals together, take in, you know, all the beauty that this, this incredible city has. And we walk all over the place. Um, I have, we have twin 25 year old daughters and they don't live at home. So they come over when we are there on weekends. Um, it's usually just my husband and myself and our 12 year old lab, Charlie. We're good people. We have tremendous pride in this house and we treat it just as we do our primary residence, which is in Los Angeles. We maintain this house and Picasso helps to maintain it impeccably. We pay property taxes to the city. We frequent, as uh, the prior speaker just mentioned, um, all of the retail and commerce in the area. You know, we load up on groceries at the vintage market and pavilions. You will see us or we'll be taking out from Malibu Brewing Company, Lily's, Spruzzo, Christie's. We're good neighbors. We help take care of the neighborhood when we're there. Uh, we pick up trash cans when they blow over or there's trash. We pick it up on the street when we're walking. We attend the flea market. We go to the local concerts and we just love being here. So thank you for this opportunity to speak and help us enjoy this, this city that we love so much. Thank you, Sid. Next, we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Thank you. I'm on vacation myself. Uh, sorry I missed 6B uh, for those of you who thought I would be here uh, on this. Uh, it's wonderful these people are here. They didn't buy a house. They bought a, they bought one eighth interest in a limited liability company. They are members of an LLC. That's all they are. Uh, they aren't sending their kids to our schools. They're, they're sure as heck not going to be working in that tent, which I heard about at uh, a little league. It's, it's too bad our trailer wouldn't work. We, we had one to give away and uh, I'm glad the solution's there, but these people aren't part of it. They're not going to be part of it. They're not part of our community. They don't want to be. They bought a security in effect. Somebody manages an investment for them. Uh, they're going to cash out when they do. Um, since they've set up an LLC, they're going to avoid um, a reappraisal under Proposition 13 because the property is owned by the LLC, not by uh, these people. They just bought a security from what may be an unlicensed security dealer. I'll let you securities lawyers work harder on that. Uh, you'll know more about it than I do. It's not where I practiced. They aren't part of the community. It's that simple. We should have people who are part of the community um, you know, show up. Let's see, I believe uh, one of those people said that he's there here for more than two months. That means he bought two interests. Uh, they get 44 days per interest. That's a month and a half. Uh, if you buy two interests, you would have three months just under it, uh, 88 days. Uh, so I don't know where that number came from. Doesn't make any sense. I read their prospectus. Uh, it's not an enterprise designed to make keep Malibu Malibu. It's not going to make Malibu better. It's going to join the sad history of the phony rehabs, the Airbnbs, uh, and and that ilk. These things are timeshares. They're not securities. Um, and don't let them escape like we as a city permitted the rehab places to get away as we permitted the short-term rentals to get away from us. Uh, we've taken too long on this, but let's get on it and take care of it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Are there any other Zoom participants? Yes, next we'll hear from Ryan. Well, thank you, Council. Uh, Ryan Embry representing Malibu Township Council. The Malibu Township Council is opposed to transient uses of single family residential properties, whether they're short term rentals or timeshares, which this proposal before you tonight is simply to clarify the code to recite uh, more specifically an existing 32 year long prohibition of this use. 
What is concerning is that the action that's being uh, requested is is a clarification is falls into the hands of the state and the Coastal Commission and so forth, which is misinterpreting our code. When in fact, our code is extremely clear in its preamble in section 17.04050. says determination of permitted uses. And the title um, is quite clearly listing permitted uses. But it's the words in the code that the city attorney will tell you really matter. And it says a use not specifically listed or determined by the director not to be included in general category or use in the chapter defining uses permitted, it shall be assumed that such uses are prohibited. So by proceeding further with a clarification to appease the Coastal Commission's inter misinterpretation of short-term rentals, for instance, um, we're opening the door to acquiescing that a challenge has some merit to the 32-year-long prohibition on short-term rentals and timeshares. So I understand the council should work in closed session to continue the prohibition which exists by law and saves Malibu and the neighborhoods from this unjust intensification of use of single family property for business uses. It is every right of local jurisdictions and cities to regulate business activity within their borders. And that's exactly what these timeshares are. They're businesses which are prohibited from the use in the single family home. This is not an attack on joint ownership of property at all. It is specific to the uses which are not allowed in the single family zone. So thank you for putting this item on the agenda, but it seems that no action is particularly necessary, um, but thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ryan. Are there any other Zoom participants? Next, we'll hear from Howard. Good evening. I just wanted to echo what a number of other people have said, and Lloyd said it best, it's a myth. In our neighborhood, the people that come, they think it's something where they have to bring all their friends. So every day there's a different set of friends. There's some multiple cars. They don't pay to maintain our roads. They're not part of our community. They come and then they leave and then another set come and leave. So they overburden our resources. They don't pay into the community. So whatever you folks decide to do to ban this, I'm for it. Thank you, Howard. And then our final speaker is Tamara Burgess. Tomorrow you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, hi. Um, thank you so much, Honorable Mayor and City Council for allowing me to speak. My name is Tamara Berger, and I'm a co-owner of a, a Picasso home in Malibu. And it saddens me to hear that the community is, is somewhat resistant to our stay because I'm a long time family community person in Malibu. My father was there all of my childhood and I spent year after year visiting him from Chicago. Um, I was engaged on the beaches in Malibu. I you now am spending time with my family in my home, although I know it's a partial home. It's a home to me nevertheless. Um, we attend Malibu churches. We work out in Malibu. We eat in Malibu, we shop in Malibu, um, and my kids went to Oaks Christian, so they have a ton of friends in Malibu. Um, so not everybody who lives in Malibu goes to the public schools. Um, the, the reality is, is we are part of the community. We are much more part of the community than people who don't use their second homes and it's their third home or fourth home. 
I've met many of my neighbors and shared glasses of wines with them, met their dogs, watched sunset at the beach, um, and really have gone out of my way since buying last year to get to know my community and be a part of it. Um, you know, I echo a lot of what the other owner said is that we really do consider it a home. Uh, we consider it our happy place and we're making lots of family memories um, in the home and uh, hope to continue to do that for many, many years to come. Thank you, Tamara. Are there any other Zoom speakers? That's all the speakers we have. Okay, so I was handed a speaker slip after the um, this item was called, and the speaker slips say, speaker slips must be submitted to the recording secretary prior, which is emphasized, to that item being announced by the mayor. Zoom allows people to raise their hand consistently until the last second. Um, the agenda doesn't say anything about when you must submit a speaker slip. I recall we had a meeting to uh, decide to go back live, and we actually did say we would follow this protocol that's on the speaker slip. I'm not comfortable unilaterally changing the policy, but I think we have to have a policy that's a policy. So I'm going to put it to the council to decide whether you want to allow people to speak with a speaker slip following the submission of the matter or whether we have to just say no, it says what it says. Trevor, am I allowed to do that now, or is that because it's not agendized, I can't have that dis that decision? No, you would have the discretion as the mayor um, to allow the speaker if you wanted to, if you want to share that with the council, you want to give their input. Okay, so I'd, li I'd like the council's concurrence on, if we're, if we're going to do, if, if I'm going to do this in my discretion now, I'm going to do it every single time for, for as long as I'm mayor, unless we adopt a different rule. So, your call. I think you're right. I, I think you are too. Do, do, Speakers are closed. Once they don't have the slip in before the item's called, they can't speak. Paul, what's your view? Who's left in the room? It doesn't matter who it is. We need to just make a decision based on the concept and not the person. It's certainly within your rights to not pick him, and I'm, that's, I'm fine with that. Doug? Uh, I think we've got to follow the rules, and uh, I think that's what the slip says. Mr. Mayor, I think the, the, the clerk wanted to say something. I'm sorry? I think the clerk wanted to say Yes, that. this might not help you in general, but just so you know, in this case, the speaker did submit the slip before the item was called, but they misidentified the item they intended to speak on. Okay, so it was an error in the transcription. Well, I'm going to make an exception then to the rule for that. Um, but it, everyone who's paying attention, we have this rule. So maybe we can put this on the agenda itself in the future so that there's no issue of anybody not understanding the rule. Okay, so Scott, you're up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I had put the wrong letter on it and then realized my mistake. The real question on this is how badly do we want to ruin Malibu? These are not people who are going to be your neighbors. If I'm correct, two of our council members are on the CERT team, as I am. None of these people are going to be on the CERT team. None of them are going to be in arson watch. None of them are going to volunteer to be on a commission. Very doubtful anyone would, any of them would put a kid in one of our schools. Yeah, they're going to come for their week and they're going to go to a restaurant here and there, and, and that's good for the business. But what's good for the neighborhoods? Not having people that you don't know, and, and clearly you're not going to know these people. They're not going to be your neighbors. They're not going to help with neighborhood associations at all. And I just can't see that this has any benefit for our city. We're struggling especially after Woolsey, to maintain our population in the schools. We've got a big problem there. And, you know, as we'll talk about in the next uh, item that comes up, 6A and B, um, we, we even have a problem trying to get people to serve on commissions, to participate. Not many people here tonight, right? These people will never come to a council meeting unless it's specific to that one issue. So I do urge you guys 
to proceed and yeah, go into a closed session, that makes a lot of sense. But we need clarification, though, uh, according to what Ryan said and some of the others, Lloyd, our rules already prohibit this, so we need to enforce it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And um, hopefully you'll put in another speaker slip for 6B as well, so that you'll be able to speak on that I one. Think I'm on 6A, but maybe I'm on 6. Oh, I'm on 6B, yeah. 6B was the one you spoke about in public comment, uh, or tried to. Okay, so do we have any further public comment? No, we don't have any other speaker slips or any raised hands from the public. Okay, so that concludes public comment. I am going to make a motion that we continue this item. Um, we can have discussion on whether it's to the next meeting or the meeting after that, but that we should have a closed session following our workshop on April 20. That we won't, we won't be short of time. We can go until however late we need to go to have the closed session rather than have it an hour before or a half hour before our regular meeting where we're always um, not having enough time to speak about it. But I believe there are substantial legal issues that we need to um, consider before we have a public discussion of what we wish to do. Uh, we won't discuss in the closed session what we want to do. We'll just discuss the legal issues and get guidance from our counsel on um, what litigation options we have, what litigation we might be looking at, and then we can decide what we wish to do. So that's my motion. Do I have a second? I think make a second, but I have one quick question, not, not on the issue. Uh, Richard, when you did your presentation, you said that based upon what we do tonight, you're going to go back and construct the ordinance. Is the ordinance not constructed yet? Do you, there is a draft. Uh, there, there is a, a, a drafted ordinance that is ready to move forward. There may be changes to it depending if there's direction from the okay, the council. Exactly. But there is a, a, a fully drafted um, ordinance that's been prepared. Uh, also, if you continue the item, I would recommend that um, you know you leave it to staff to set that meeting um, so to make sure that this is this is not a meeting to consider um, to consider legislation or any of the topics that are here tonight, but um, may potentially be held um, related related to issues of potential litigation, um, and leave that to the discretion of staff to to put that closed session forward. But just to uh, continue the item, provide the opportunity for staff to set a closed session for any necessary legal um, issues. Right. And so, and I'm, I'm well. I'm, I'll, I'm open to any other discussion, obviously. But I think it makes sense, as much as this is a um, urgent issue of sorts, um, that we continue it to two meetings from now. Because if we're going to have a closed session a week, a week and a half from now, it, I don't know that the staff can be prepared to um, deal with whatever we decide we want to to give us a, a report and for us to have an informed discussion um, a couple days later. I think we need to wait one more meeting. So the motion, so that's is, to, the motion. is to continue it, the, the item for two weeks? Okay. I mean, for two, to the, to the eighth, is that correct? So Steve, is that okay? Second. I'm, 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 I'm with you, okay. I'll second that. All right, so is there discussion on the motion? I just want to echo the fact that we need to move promptly and urgently on this. I think uh, the emails we saw, this goes back for almost over a year. And it's time to get it uh, functionally function solutional decision made on yeah. Steve, Steve and I raised this and maybe Paul did as well two years ago right. so it's yeah, we want to get it done. yeah we want to get something done. any any further discussion on whether to adjourn or not to adjourn, um, or continue or not to continue okay Let, let's have a roll call please on the motion to continue to um, the first meeting of May with a closed session to be held on April 20, following the end of the workshop. A second. No, it was already seconded. We're voting. Now. We should roll call. Yes. So the roll call, Mayor. I just want to clarify, Mayor. The, the you're not setting a particular closed session. It's not a closed session um, on this item. No. You're just providing opportunity for staff to set a closed session, um, and you're identifying that that date. The closed session is to receive input on legal issues. And just if we could potential litigation one direction or another the okay I, I'm just asking if you just leave the discretion for staff to set the closed session um, that, would, that would be coming I'm sorry I'm not understanding your question I just I just want to clarify for the record that we're not setting a closed session to to, to, to cover the the meetings agenda tonight the item for us of initiating it that is being continued to May the first meeting in May that's and correct you are um, and then um, Staff will set a, a, cl a closed yes, session. Yes, that's completely correct. Okay. 
May 8th, not mm -hmm. April 20th. The first meeting of May, for, okay. of whatever that, whatever date that is. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank the council for that accommodation. Um, does anybody break? want to take a break? Yeah. Any objections? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna recess for um, 10 minutes, or let's make it 12 minutes. We'll be back at 9.30.
Kelsey, could we uh, fade in? Just give us 30 seconds. There you go. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're back. Uh, so that takes us to item 6A, uh, Homelessness Task Force recommendations regarding public safety and public outreach. Remote participants, again, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item and you will be called after the staff report. And as a reminder to the few people that are still here in person, if you would like to speak on this, please get your card in ASAP. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor and Council. So this evening, I, I'm here to report out on a recommendation from the Homelessness Task Force having to do with public safety and outreach. So at uh, their last meeting in March, they voted in favor of recommending to the Council to prioritize securing emergency beds with the 100,000 that was appropriated uh, last August. As you may recall, uh, that decision, you know, then generated an RFP, which we went out and we were able to secure three beds with the people concerned, but those are not emergency bed, those are interim shelter beds. So they're not always available. So sometimes if we wanna uh, enforce, say, the camping ordinance, uh, kind of the trick is that you have to be able to offer an open bed. And with the interim shelter beds, that's not necessarily the case. So that's what's behind this is that they want us to continue to look for emergency shelter beds that we can secure. And so they're recommending that we continue to look for those beds and for the council to continue to approve that appropriation of 100,000 to have available to us for that. And that kind of is connected to their next item, which is continue to support LASD and their enforcement of all codes and vigorously provide the help necessary to overcome the court mandated legal requirements. And that's referring to being able to offer a bed. So those two are very much connected. And the last item was to confirm that the issue of people living in vehicles within Malibu community is within the task force charter to address. And this is coming out of um, multiple conversations that we've had in our meetings where it wasn't 100% clear where their charter assignments um, ended. And we're gonna talk more about this actually in the next agenda item. So I don't know how far you wanna go on this particular issue because I included it in the next item which is on charter progress. Um, but on this one, you know, and looking at folks that live in vehicles while definitely looking at people who are unhoused living in vehicles is within their charter. Um, oftentimes the conversations got into parking enforcement and that's where it got a little bit blurry at times. And so they wanna get some clarification on that. Um, within this, they felt that they also came up with public outreach recommendations. They thought that it was very much connected to the public safety aspect and their recommendations include hosting a community meeting to provide information and solicit public feedback. Um, also design and administer an ongoing social media campaign, offer opportunities for volunteering, designate a space to do so, supply informational handouts to businesses and individuals, which we have done in the past when we first started uh, work with the, the people concerned we did a big effort to hand out these little business cards. And so we probably need to do that again. And that's what behind is behind that. Uh, create community bulletin boards, both physical and digital. And that's kind of like looking for community kiosks and post information, or even maybe create some digital bulletin boards in the community. That would be like those electronic sign boards. You might see some places where there's like information posted digitally um, so that's an option, but I don't know if there is any currently around the city, but the idea is we could do that too. Um, also, they want to revisit the homelessness strategic plan and then encourage the city council to track and support state and federal bills that address medical and mental health needs of the unhoused. Oh, shoot. I think that was it. Okay. And that summarizes their recommendation um, available for any questions.
Thank you, Susan. Does anybody have any questions, not comments, before we go to public comment? Okay. So I was not handed any speaker slips. Is there anybody on Zoom? Yes, you have two speakers uh, participating remotely. Uh, first, we'll hear from Ryan. Um, I wanted you to have the staff uh, explain what the task of the task force is or was and whether or not the recommendations of the task force that were presented just now complete the city council's uh, vision of what the task force was to do or if that was just simply to come up with these recommendations. Um, because your item is coming up as whether to disband or to reformulate um, for a, a similar purpose, a group of uh, appointed folks to deal with um, the ongoing issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we will hear from Carmel. <clears throat> Carmel, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, we'll come back to them. Um, and last, we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Bill, are you there? Bill, we hear that. audio, but you're unclear. Uh-oh. I may have a bad connection. I'm... <laughs> we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll sit closer. Uh, the screen looks a lot different than the last time I did this. Uh, um, Okay, I am on the task force. And the third item there about people living in parked vehicles came up several times. Uh, one time uh, staff removed it from our agenda after we'd specifically asked that it be on the next agenda and therefore the meeting didn't even take place. Um, it, it wasn't we're trying to exceed our authority. It, parking the legions of parked vehicles, housing people, sometimes in half million dollar vehicles, sometimes in pieces of junk is clearly a problem. And it seems to be closely related or in fact part of homelessness, at least in some of the instances. Um, and all we wanted to do was work with the sheriff, the city, whoever, um, to try to make those problems go away. Um, the frustration in it after I think we added a car to look a sheriff's car look for these things was sufficient to get Chris Frost to drop out. Um, and if there's a somebody more public safety oriented than Chris, I don't know him or her. Uh, I'd like to keep doing this um, as far as homelessness and the vehicles are concerned. I see it as part of the homelessness problems. Uh, but you guys are my boss. I serve at the I guess at the pleasure uh, specifically of uh, Mayor Silverstein who appointed me. Um, by the way, if there are any public members out there who are interested in this, I think we are short of members, but if we're disbanded, it's irrelevant. But let me just, I, I will diverge, I admit it from the topic, but um, it has frustrated some of us that we're having trouble keeping members. I posted on next door and stuff, trying to get them, so is Wayne Cohen. Um, Anyway, um, I think the vehicular problem is part of the homelessness problem. If, if you disagree, you're the boss. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Are there any other speakers? Uh, we'll try one more time. We have a user, Carmel. Uh, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Sorry, <clears throat> Sorry I'm, I just joined. I was waiting for 6D. D. 6D. Uh, we already have covered 6D. We're, we're beyond that. Okay. So, thank you. Any other? And that, that's all the speakers we have. Okay, so that closes public comment, brings us back to council. Who would like to start on this one? Uh, I would suggest that we uh, review and receive this report 
and then actually uh, move on to the next agenda item where I think most of the discussion is going to be. Well, this is right. this is not a review and receive. This is actually a. Well, it says review or report. I'll provide direction to staff. Should we have heard A and B together, or? Yeah, I, I, I thought of that, but since we had not formally moved to do that earlier, it made more sense to just continue the agenda the way we had approved it. Um, if no one else wants to make substantive comments, I, I, I'll take a shot at it first before we decide what to do here. Um, one, I can't tell you how frustrated I am every time I hear about this court-mandated legal requirement that does not exist. Um, the law could not, the law is not crystal clear on a lot of things, but if the law couldn't be clearer on this. The requirement that there be a bed is a requirement that exists in order to criminalize the mere act of sitting, sleeping, or resting in public. That's the holding of the Martin versus Boise decision and its progeny. Um, you don't have to have beds to enforce our more recently adopted and fully vetted camping ordinance, which provides restrictions on the re reasonable restrictions on the time, place, and manner of doing those things in Malibu. We have specified places that are off limits to doing any of those things, sitting, sleeping, or, or resting. Um, and I don't mean somebody sitting down for five minutes on a park bench, but, but we, have a, we, have a, we have a law that we vetted and we very carefully adopted, which does not criminalize those things. And there is no requirement that there be a bed to require, to require somebody to leave those specified places or to not use specified accessories. And every time I hear that we can't do that unless we have a bed, it really aggravates me because that's just not the law. It's made up by our staff. And I, and I wish, and it may, maybe it's made up by the Sheriff's Department, but I don't think so. But I wish we would start enforcing the law that we have and not a lure that doesn't exist. The other thing I'll say is, and we, we may be, this may not matter after we have the next item, but I can't understand how it could be the case that people living in vehicles is not part of the charter of the homelessness task force because our statute, which deals with unhoused people, explicitly deals with people living in a car or not in a car. So, um, I, and, and I have a problem once again with the fact that after the task force, I think through its chair, put that item on an agenda, the staff struck it is my understanding. And I don't yeah, think that's, that's not that, actually that's not what, what happened. happened. No. <laughs> I can okay. explain if you'd like. Well, that, 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 that's what was reported to me by yeah. multiple members I understand. of the um, task force. But in any event, I, in my view, it couldn't be clearer that people camping in vehicles is a part of the, um, the mandate of the task force. So um, my direction, um, if others agree, would be that, to the, that, that we, we do whatever we need to do to clarify that there is no legal requirement for enforcing our camping law as it is written. Uh, if somebody is sleeping where they're allowed to in Malibu, then there's nothing we can do about it. It doesn't even matter if we have beds. But if they're where they're not supposed to be, for example, within a thousand foot feet of a school, that, that's, that's one of the clear examples, um, and the law enforcement directs them to leave that area because they are violating our law, they have two choices. They can do as they're told or they can disobey a lawful command of the police force, of the sheriff's department. And I think, I, I could be wrong about this, but I believe disobeying a lawful directive of a law enforcement officer is itself a different crime, which can be um, dealt with. So um, those are my comments. Does anybody else have any? Paul? Bruce, I'm a, I'm a little... I guess I never heard that we heard back from the Sheriff's Department's legal counsel that they were willing to enforce it without us having beds available. Did they do that? We were told by the former captain of the Lost Hills Department and, and the liaison as well 
when we, um, we, we vetted our draft statute with them, and we were told that that statute would be enforced. That statute does not require that there be a bed. That statute, again, places reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on where and how you can engage in the act of camping. We have a different statute that actually prohibits camping full stop anywhere, but that cannot be enforced unless we have an equal number of beds as we have numbers of people living that way in Malibu. Okay. Thank you. Is that it, Paul? Yeah. Doug? Uh, just a quick clarification with uh, Susan. Uh, I didn't do the homeless count this year, but the prior three years I did it, and I believe we were uh, instructed to count people that were in their cars in the mm -hmm. homeless count. That's correct, right? Mm -hmm. As well as RVs. Yes. So when we talk about homeless okay. people, they are the homeless people that are deemed to be sleeping in their cars overnight. Correct. And we have, like Eamon stated before, uh, we do understand that addressing people living in their cars is part of their charter. That's not the question. The question is more of to, to what extent are they addressing it because a lot of our conversations got into parking enforcement and there was some feeling that that was kind of crossing into like Public Safety Commission's area of uh, discussion that the task force was not charged with examining parking enforcement. Um, so there's some overlap with what, you know, Public Safety Commission might do as opposed to what the task force might do. And I guess that's where we want clarification. And that's even mentioned in the, um, in the next agenda item for the charter. If you want to add this and clarify that, yes, we're okay with them looking at parking enforcement as part of addressing unhoused individuals and vehicles. I think that's the clarification that we're looking for. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, just to follow up on that, you know, the, the law, sometimes the distinctions in the law are subtle. Mm -hmm. um, parking and camping are two completely different acts. Parking mm -hmm. involves a vehicle that's sitting with nobody in it, whether it can or can't be where it is, that's parking. Um, we have an oversized vehicle parking ordinance. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're camping or not camping. It's a parking issue. Mm -hmm. But we also have a camping ordinance that says you can't be camping in a vehicle or out of a vehicle in certain places using certain things. So I would think that it's pretty clear that the mandate of the task force does include unhoused people camping slash living mm -hmm. in vehicles. And it doesn't include enforcing our parking ordinances. That's, that's a different subject altogether. But it, we, you shouldn't blur the two just because one, because they both involve a vehicle. They aren't right. the same thing, but parking they and were, camping. so they were frequently talking about the parking enforcement. And, and that's exactly why we want clarifications. Um, so we're on the same page on this. <laughs> um, because we have different parking regulations that we put into place to help address the issue of people living on PCH. We have, you know, the staggered times, we've got, we have a, a number of different, you know, no parking 12 to five, and of course, no sleeping in your vehicle, which is part of the camping right. ordinance. So for what it's worth, yeah. though, my, my view is that the camping in vehicles is part of the mandate of the task force and parking ordinances are not. Okay. So I don't know that we need a motion for this. We've given some direction. We have received the report, and we can move on to the next issue unless anybody else has comments. Okay, so that takes us to 6B. Um, again, if you're on Zoom and you wish to comment on 6B, please raise your hand. If you are here and have, have not yet put in a slip and wish to, please put in your slip, and we'll take the staff report. All right. Next item. Mm -hmm. Is it showing? Yeah, that's the right one. There it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, homelessness Task Force Charter Progress. Um, so this evening, I'm going to go through each of the charter assignments. And just highlight just 
very high level of you know what they've done to address those specific charter assignments. So the first one being to review the homelessness strategic plan goals and objectives. Uh, while there's been you know much discussion on this, the action items they have taken include in April of 2022, the task force reviewed and revised the strategic plan goals and objectives. Um, and then it was kind of put on pause and come all the way to March. Um, they decided that they want to re-review that strategic plan again before submitting it to the city council. Um, and there's a number of things that happen in between, but that is where that stands right now. Other item was review the concept, need, and possible implementation of an alternative sleeping location. So in February of 2022, the task force approved an ASL recommended action plan, which was presented to the council last March in 2022. And then the following April, the task force voted in favor of recommending that the council direct staff to pursue the option of securing beds at existing homeless facilities with the use of city funds. Because if you recall, in February, when it was originally brought, or actually it was brought to the council in March, um, the first uh, direction from council was for us to look for beds outside of the city, but do not use city funds. Uh, that didn't work out very well. Um, we could find beds, but we weren't, at the time, able to do that without using city funds. So that's why it came back requesting city funds. But miraculously, we managed to find other funds to fund this. In the end, we ended up being able to do what was the original direction of council. So uh, this item is, to some degree, accomplished. While it's not like a whole facility dedicated for our use, right now we have three beds, and we do potentially have the option for getting more beds, and we're looking into that. So I would say this is a, a very good accomplishment of the task force. Develop a plan to mitigate public safety environmental impacts. This is uh, referring back to the item we just had. Um, again, prioritize securing emergency shelter beds with 100,000 appropriated by the City Council last August. Continue to support LASD in the enforcement of all codes and confirm whether the issue of people living in vehicles is within the task force charter. Explore new ideas to address homelessness research strategies used by other jurisdictions. So they've done quite a few things. Uh, we've done quite a few field trips in 2021. Um, not all the task force members, but a, a bunch of them, uh, probably you know three or four, sometimes five of them. We went out and visited a tiny home village in Wilmington. We went to the city of Redondo Beach, and then we went to Baldwin Park later in 2022. And then more recently, city of Santa Barbara uh, attended our meeting, gave us a really great presentation, providing information about what, what they do. So um, these are just highlights. People have been doing a lot of other research on the side as task force members. Um, so there has been a lot of research into what other jurisdictions have done. And we are um, learning and looking at employing some of those things. Develop a robust public engagement outreach plan to obtain community input. So last month, this was part of the last agenda item that I spoke about last month, the task force adopted a report which included the following recommendation, hosting a community meeting, design and administer a social media campaign, offer opportunities for volunteering and designated space to do so, supply informational handouts to businesses and individuals, create community bulletin boards, physical and digital, revisit the homelessness strategic plan and encourage the city council to track and support state and federal bills that address medical and mental health needs of the unhoused. So the task force, you know, overall then has, is still working on all but one of the charter assignments, um, which would be the ASL one, because that's the one that they feel that's pretty much complete. And then the task force is also interested in having the issue of people sleeping in their cars added to their charter. Uh, the task force, though, has a concern about the in inability to meet quorum. Um, and that's just more of recent. We've had uh, a few meetings where we just barely made quorum or we had to call people to call into the meeting so that we can make quorum to make a decision. 
Um, and the concern is that once we go to in-person meetings, that this is gonna be even more challenging because if we're having trouble getting people onto a Zoom meeting, once they have to come in person, it could be even more difficult. So in thinking about this, and I just wanna put it out there that I am in no way advocating for any particular item. We just kind of you know, threw up some options to deal with the quorum issue. Um, these are things that I've heard you know, people discuss, but um, they kind of seem like somewhat some of the more obvious uh, alternatives, which of course, if you have other alternatives, um, I think we can bring those forward too. I mean, we can leave the task force as is and just fill the, fill the vacant positions because I think we have three vacant positions which makes it difficult to meet quorum right now. We can reduce the task force size to make it easier. Right now it's a 10 member body and maybe making it a five member body would make it easier if we could find five people who could commit to attending an in-person meeting. That would be great as opposed to 10. That might be trickier, but totally your decision. Um, of course, you can always disband the task force. I mean, task force aren't necessarily meant to be permanent um, organizational bodies. Um, or you can disband the task force and direct staff to establish an advisory council. And that suggestion was just made because then we can still keep the task force going, but in a different format that doesn't have council appointed members, thereby you don't have to have Brown Act, you don't have to meet quorum, and it, it could just help resolve that issue. Of course, there are, are benefits and costs to all these decisions. Um, I can say even just from my perspective watching the task force, yes, they do struggle with the Brown Act rules. It's a little tricky at times, they get very frustrated. But at the same time, I can say that it does help um, for those with dissenting opinions. It does allow them to be heard possibly a little bit more. So I can understand perspectives on both sides. And um, I guess I, I leave it to you to decide how you wanna handle this. Thank you, Susan. And if we decide to keep the task first, we do. Well, I think we've already kind of determined the issue on the cars. Um, and then also, if you want to keep them, you know, if we need to add a more specific assignment to the charter, we could do that too, regarding people and their cars. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions before we go to public comment? Okay. We have two in person speakers. We'll start off with Joe Drummond, and then we'll hear from Scott Dietrich. Um, Mr. Mayor, sir, before we open public comment, I just wanted to um, just make a disclosure for the record. You Sorry? Know, I want to make a disclosure for the record that there was an email that was sent out um, by Mr. Dietrich um, earlier that did, it was sent to the whole council that did mention contact with two council members and an abundance of caution. We're just disclosing this email. It's available publicly here if anybody wants to see it. And it was a mistake, and Scott meant nothing by it. <laughs> exactly. Joe, go ahead. Honorable Mayor Silverstein and City Council, the last two alternatives please cannot be considered. Volunteer advisory council groups aren't taken seriously, and this is a serious topic for our city and our residents. Jefferson Wagner, our former mayor and council member, just told me the last time when we were meeting here that the manager of his of the store above his was <clears throat> assaulted by a homeless guy who has just been in town for a year and the police were called and he escaped into our city hills. So he's still on the loose. Um, I ask that we maintain the homelessness task force until these problems of fires starting in our hills and violent assaults stop within our city limits. We just heard yet again that Tuna Canyon's regular occurring encampments were cleared out again, thankfully. This is too serious an issue to pass on to private entities who don't know all the problems of our residents that we've endured. We need a voice of our own city, city's actual residents, not those who come looking for a luxury haven on our streets and don't want the help offered, which is a majority of the newer unhoused here. There's a huge positive list of great accomplishments completed by the task force and it needs to continue whether you need to reduce the number to reach a quorum or appoint new members. 
They just requested to seek solutions in collaboration with city staff, LASD, and homeless service providers to address the increase in the number of people living in vehicles within the Malibu community. They need to be moved to an alternative sleeping area outside of the city. There are many compassionate yet reasonable residents, such as Hap Henry, Henry I'm sure, who would be happy to volunteer to help solve and not attract more homeless issues here in the city that we would like to keep safe and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. Um, <clears throat> I've been on the task force since its inception. And yes, we have struggled. There's different points of engagement. People want different things. They come from different political spectrums. Within the task force, however, we have managed to work together to come up with really good compromises. The, so I think the best solutions. And because we're under the Brown Act, even when some of us, I don't know who screw up occasionally. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Trevor and Paul. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been a very, very good and positive experience working with people from both sides. The problem with an advisory group is it tends to get homeless advocates and they push one side of it, namely that the homeless have unfettered rights and they should be all given wonderful housing next door to you and uh, fed. And the problem with that is it doesn't work. We see the failure of the housing first side of the equation in city after city, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the crime. <laughs> and worse of all is the homeless aren't getting the help. Our staff, Susan and Lewis, have worked really tirelessly. When we find somebody who's willing to accept services, which is unusual, most of these are transients or they're so drug addled or mentally ill they, they won't accept help and that's sad because the end result is they die. They get killed by another homeless, they get attacked that's why a lot of homeless don't want to be in a shelter because they're afraid or of course they overdose. So I, I do recommend you keep the task force. At one point back in November after the election, I thought, gee, we don't need new members. We accomplished our main goal. We found the beds um, hosted by the People's Concern who I think is a great organization. But then we start to see complexities and I was convinced by other members on the task force that we should not disband. So I've changed my mind on that. And as Sergeant Sutherland mentioned today, they're given a RV a, t a ticket, right? Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Okay, do we have anybody on Zoom? Yes, first we will hear from Ryan. Um, no, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> All right, next we'll hear from Bill Sampson. Thank you. Like Scott, I have been on the task force since its inception. Um, it actually has been a remarkable group. I, I would, I suspect other than his vote for me, Scott and I have never voted for the same person for anything. Uh, I suspect that for her vote against me, uh, Terry Davis and I have always voted for the same people, uh, prob probably not in Malibu. Uh, that is some indication of the level of collegiality. I will say that um, uh, as Susan's remarks about why the problem happened with one meeting, Mr. Silverstein, you heard correctly from the task force members. An agenda item was pulled without notice to any of us that had been specifically authorized and directed by us to be on our own agenda. Uh, therefore, a meeting was wasted. Um, we didn't do that. <clears throat> Moving forward, 
Um, I do not know how it is possible to camp in a vehicle without parking. Although there are Darwin Award rumors of people going to the back of their moving bus while it's on autopilot and crashing into things. But all we, we did try to get the sheriffs or at least talk about having the sheriffs go and knock on doors or whatever they are permitted to do when they see camping type vehicles parked on the road. And I appreciate there's a legal distinction between camping and parking. Um, as I said, um, if you're in a vehicle, I camp in vehicles sometimes, I can't do it without parking it somewhere. Um, and neither can any of these people. And there are too darn many of them. As far as disbanding of it, it um, Rosemary tonight told me how grateful she was that she got to see me on Monday evenings. And here I am on vacation with her sitting across the table from me and she doesn't get me, but uh, I am willing to keep doing it. I would hope it would stay by Zoom because if we do not disband, I will not attend the next in-person meeting because I plan to still be where I am. Uh, but I have met some pretty good people. Most of my work has been done uh, uh, as opposed to direct outreach uh, with the legal ad hoc committee. Uh, there are two pretty smart lawyers on that, Ian Robin and Wayne Cohen. Uh, it's been my honor and uh, privilege to serve with them on the legal ad hoc. Uh, I, I won't speak for them. My impression is that they agree with me. Uh, I tend to agree with Mr. Silverstein pretty much on the what the holding and Martin really means. Um, whether we can get county council to go along with that is another problem, and that's one for somebody else, but I'll keep working on it if I'm permitted or you want me to stay on the council, or excuse me, on the task force, and Mr. Silverstein, of course, could fire me. Okay, thank you, Bill. Thank you. And that's, that's all your speakers on Zoom. Okay, so that'll close public comment. Um, that brings us to council, and I see Paul is anxious to say something first. I'm anxious to. Uh, I'm, I uh, I did my math, and I saw that my two uh, appointees are still on the the thing, and so there are three missing. And I wonder if the people who have a vacancy want to uh, use this as an opportunity to seek new people to appoint. I'm going to go next if I can. Um, when this first came up, I was vehemently, maybe too strong, but very opposed to disbanding the um, task force because I think it's too important a subject to um, not have a Brown Act body that's responsible to the public and responsible to the city council um, dealing with the subject. And, and by way of background, to say that before the Homelessness Task Force was formed, the community group that was superseded by the Homeless Task Force, and I don't mean they've been displaced, but that they've, that the formal decisions that have been made for the city are now coming through the Homelessness Task Force, that they were focused, as best I could tell, on feeding the unhoused and, and, find, and, and providing other help to the unhoused, but they were not focused on the um, public health, safety, and welfare aspect of this, which affects 99% of the population. Uh, and Malibu was becoming a magnet for unhoused. As I said earlier, the unhoused in Malibu aren't from Malibu. They're not, they didn't lose their house in Malibu. They are coming here from outside Malibu because it's a great place to live, even if you don't have a house. It's a much, if, you, if you have to live unhoused, you might as well live unhoused in a beautiful place uh, where you get to overlook the ocean and live in the mountains. So um, we, we were, our unhoused population was growing year after year. We formed the um, task force and the unhoused population has been shrinking. We, we, we became more aggressive in our law. We became more focused on um, reducing the unhoused population in Malibu through the task force. And lo and behold, there's been a shrinkage, a, a substantial shrinkage. Uh, I don't think that those are coincidences that it was growing before and it's been shrinking since, especially since because of COVID, the unhoused population in most other places has been growing for the past two years and here it's been shrinking. So I was very much against disbanding the task force um, because under the Brown Act, we're allowed to speak to one other member of the city council, but not more than one. I reached out to Doug and I expressed that view. 
And um, Doug's initial view was, um, and he can speak, I, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but his view basically was, um, it, was an, it was a drain on the city's resources to have the task force because we have to have more meetings, more Brown Act meetings, more staff involvement, staff reports, um, and compounding that if the meetings weren't going forward because of a lack of quorum, um, it was just, it was, it was wasting maybe too strong a word, but it was a drain on the city's resources. Um, after we spoke for a while, I, we reached what I think is a good compromise, um, and it's what I'm going to advance to the um, city council, uh, which is that we do disband the task force, but we assign the work that was previously of the task force to the public safety commission, if they've got the bandwidth to handle it. That will retain a Brown Act committee. It will be one that has had no problem having a um, quorum, and meet, they, re, they meet regularly. Um, they're assigned one person by each of us, so instead of having two from each of us, there'll be one from each of us. Uh, and I think that's a great compromise if, if the rest of the council is willing to support that. Um, so those are my comments, and I'll, I'll make a motion that we um, formally disband the task force and um, assign the charter of the task force to the Public Safety Commission uh, henceforth. Do you have a second? I'll make a second on that, but I'd like to put some comments forward on this because this is one of the most important things in our city. Um, I think uh, every city sometimes forgets us sometimes uh, that safety is the number one priority. And whether it's the sheriff's department, the fire department, or how you deal with public health, these are all safety issues that are important to the city, first and foremost. Now, I spent almost four years on public safety commission before coming to the council. And one of the first things we ran into at public safety commission was a homeless issue. You've heard me, those of you that know me, know I talk a lot in examples. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about real quick is, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. You've heard, there is a person in staff hadn't heard that from me around here. I, I see a couple of them shaking their heads. Yes, that's, that's true, that's a Dougism. Um, so let's talk about the numbers. In 2019, the homeless issue in Malibu was becoming a real, real problem. The homeless count in early 2020 was 254 homeless. And the reason why I made the point, uh, the item beforehand, that includes people sleeping in their cars, RVs, in tents, outside, on the bus benches. And I participated in three of the four homeless counts since 20, uh, starting in 2020. Now, the homeless task force was formed in July of 2021, and the results from the uh, 21 uh, count, which was done in the uh, spring, hadn't come out yet. But let me tell you what had happened between 2019 and 2020. We got the oversized vehicle ordinance out of storage, put that back in place. We had parking changed on PCH from one side to the other. We got that passed with, with the county and the Coastal Commission. We also got the MET teams, the uh, mental evaluation teams and the host teams became much more predominant here in Malibu thanks to the Sheriff's Department. And People Concern, which was already in place and was a, a wonderful institution started by volunteers uh, in the city to fund that, the city took it over and we had a, a people active there, plus the COG put a, a representative for homelessness in the area, and we also hired an additional person in the public safety department to be involved in this, and the task force was formed. Almost as soon as the task force was formed, the count came in from the homeless count at 154, 165, I can't remember what the 21 number was. We already had a substantial reduction because of the things that were already in process. Fast forward to 2022, 81 people, all right? The count that just got done, and I'm not going to let any cats out of the bag so nobody's told me what the number is, but the, the feeling was there were fewer people than the prior year. I'm going to say, and Susan, you can shake your head yes or no, somewhere around less than, 70, less than 80, 75, maybe somewhere in there, without some more. The point of this is we've had a quiet, and I've talked about this whole time in public safety, I talked about it in the office. We've had a quiet success story on the homeless issue here in Malibu. Yes, there are people homeless and unhoused in Malibu. Yes, there are these are the hardcore ones that have addiction issues, mental health issues, 
and a few of them need a hand up, not a hand out. We're working with those people one agenda at a time. The homeless task force was a perfect item to have when we had the homeless counts in the hundreds. We need a different chapter, a different approach now that we're in the 80, 75 or so. The Public Safety Commission has always had this as part of their responsibilities. That's the reason why the Public Safety Department is the one that's running the homeless task force. So I'm suggesting in agreement with Bruce as we talked about this, let's have the Public Safety Department wrap their arms around what the homeless task force did. The homeless task force people that want to be involved can still make their, their comments, they can be involved. The Public Safety Commission is always looking for people to be involved. And by the way, and I'm, and I'm going to pick on it, the counts that I did uh, for the homeless counts, I don't believe there was anybody that's on a task force that did the counts with us. And this is an opportunity to go out and sort of kick the tires and see the people. And that's one of the things that the Public Safety Commission does. Some of the volunteers that you see around town that have been involved in this have gotten out and seen these people. So I'm going to encourage us to do this motion. This is the right, in my opinion, the right step at the right time. Let's keep the involved people, the uh, advocates for the homeless, the ones that are helping out on a regular basis can still do that. They'll still be involved with the Public Safety Commission as an outreach. And believe me, here's the other thing. The Homeless Task Force, you looked at the composition of it, of the 10 members, we had between four and five of those members were commission members somewhere else. Scott Dietrich, Chris Frost, Josh Spiegel. Uh, I'm trying to think there was somebody else on it, that at least one or two other people. So we've diluted our other commissions in order to, to function the Homeless Task Force. Let's bring them back together, get our resources in one place, and let's, let's maximize the benefit of our resources to apply to the problem we have. At 250, it was a different problem. At 80, 75, it's a different problem. So I'm recommending a, uh, approval, and I'll make a second on it. Steve. Okay, sounds to me you just made the argument that makes me think we should keep the Homeless Task Force, okay? I do that? Yeah, you did a good job of it. I mean, look. The homeless problem is not over. You're right. It has been reduced significantly, and I think part of that reduction is a result of the fact that we've got this homeless task force that has been focused on trying to do exactly that. All right? They, you know, they, they're the ones who are trying to chase down the people sleeping in their cars. They're the ones that um, call the sheriff about people sleeping up in the hills. Uh, and, I, I don't, and I don't think that problem, they've done a good job. And I don't think that job is done. I look over the horizon a little bit, okay? One of the things that causes homeless, homelessness is the economy. I'll tell you what, there's an inflation right now going on. There's a chance of a recession coming up someplace. And they just removed the, the rules dealing with protecting people who are running, who can't be uh, expelled from a rental property. The homeless count is not going to go down. I don't think it's going to go down, all right? And... I think we should be, look, if I'm wrong and it does go down, all, all I've done is, is kept this homeless task force in place for another year to protect the residents of Malibu against any potential, potential increase. If it, if it doesn't go down, I think they're the best people we have to help protect the, to help protect the residents against any increase in a homeless population. They're the ones I think they have done, and I don't argue with the Planning Commission, I mean the Public Safety Commission. There's a lot, but look, I'm, I'm now taking work away from the homeless task force, giving it to the public safety commission. I mean, I still got tra problems with traffic on PCH. I mean, the, the public safety commission's got a lot of stuff it's got to do. And that, none of that's going away. And what you're recommending is we take more stuff and put it back on their plate. I don't know if that's a good idea, all right? I mean, I haven't heard from the public safety commission come up and say, yeah, we, we think we can handle all this stuff and give us more, all right? Uh, so my suggestion is I would not disband the Homeless Task Force. Uh, if we want to reduce it from 10 members to 5 members, that may be a process to help us get it through. But I think we need this dedicated team focused on the homeless issue and doing everything that they can in terms of suggestions, you know, checking people sleeping in cars, whatever the heck it is, to provide the, the best level of protection for the Malibu residents. So I'm, I'm not going to agree to disband the task force. Marianne, do you have any comments? Well, 
Well, first, I want to thank everyone who has volunteered for the Homeless Task Force. I think you have had great discussions, um, and I think a lot of great ideas have come out of that. Um, I would say one of the other things that has occurred over the timeline that Doug outlined was the robust nature of our public safety department. They have expanded their people, they are aware of the issues, and they've worked closely with the Sheriff's Department and with other agencies in order to provide solutions that our community needs and wants. And so I want to say thank you to them also. Um, I'm inclined at this time to join in with um, Bruce and Doug in disbanding it and transferring the items back over to the Public Safety Commission. We can always revisit this if we see things come up, but right now we're on a good trend. We've got some positive things going on, and um, I think that, that public safety can absolutely handle um, and continue to implement the recommendations that have been put forward by the community. And yes, you know, join in on the Public Safety Commission meetings. They're a, a great, lively thing that everybody should join and um, have fun with, and you know, they'll take your comments, they'll listen, and um, definitely have informed decisions based on it. I'm just make a last couple comments, unless someone else wants to make anything further. I, I want to join Mary, and I had made a notice, and I forgot to say, I, I do want to compliment everyone that was on the task force, that's been on the task force for the past two years. They, they, they have done a great job. They've done a great service to the city. I also want to thank Sergeant Sutherland for hanging out throughout this, this whole discussion. Um, and I want to offer, if you have any questions about my assessment of how the law works, or, or any of us for that matter, we're, we're here, we're, we'll be happy to speak with you and, and entertain any questions, because I, I, I do think there's been a little bit of a disconnect publicly about what, how our law works. It's an unusual, different new law that most other places don't have. Um, Steve, I, I understand the desire to keep the test results. Like I said, I, that's where I started out. It, it seemed to me that you know the, the, there are three options on the table. And I, I see where this is going, but there's three options on the table. One was keep things the way they are. One was disband it and turn this back over to a community group as existed before we created the task force, which in my view was going in the wrong direction. And as a result of the conversation I have with Doug, I, I think we re reached a great compromise, which is to give it to the Public Safety Commission. Um, Doug's on the commission, so he, even though he's not now, I think he has a good idea of what their bandwidth is and, and what they can and can't do. Um, plus, as Marianne just said, and I made a note of this too, we, we can always reactivate the task force if doing that, if, if disbanding them and putting it to the Public Safety Commission turns out to be too big a chore for the Public Safety Commission. If they need the help, we could always reactivate the task force. So for all those reasons, I, th I think it's a great compromise. Comprom I, I don't compromise when I think the issue is critical and it needs to, you need to put, put it down, but I think this is a great one to compromise. I hope you'll join us in voting for this. And um, if there's no other comment, we can call the question, but maybe there is. Okay, let's go Paul first, then you okay. stay. I, I find myself wondering what kind of business or sport there is where when you're winning, you stop doing what's working and want to try something else, like giving it to somebody else who's doing a great job with another job. They're doing a fabulous job, the, the public safety group is. But I, I can't see that they have enough bandwidth to, to take this on, maybe they do. But I think that when you're winning and when things are going well, uh, having, uh, si that's si if it's 65, even if it's 50, that isn't zero, it's not close to zero. And where my office is located, if I wanna do a homeless count, all I need to do is look out the window and I'll see them coming, coming by the window. And it's, uh, you know, the ones who have been the frequent flyers, have, there's been a pretty good, uh, the sheriffs have done a great job of finding help for the ones who are always available, who are always there for us. Uh, and those people are showing up less and less, but there's new ones coming in every day. And if we don't uh, continue to focus on it, 
the, the, the count's going to go the other direction. And I think that that's just the way most things are. This is a maintenance problem. It's not, it's not declare victory and go home, in my opinion. So I'm in agreement with Steve's uh, recommendations earlier, but you know, like everybody else, I know how to count. So, Steve, and then Doug, one more. Got a question for Doug. Go ahead, you know, Doug mentioned that that his part of his recommendations is because there is so much work for everybody else that it's stressing out some component of our city. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Who has complained? I'm just who came to you and said, you know, damn, I'm so stressed out. Like we can't do this anymore. I need a better way to do it. Or is that just your opinion of what's going on? No, I think. Uh, I think when you look at the fact that we've had people resign from the commission because it was taking taking too much time, and I think also in talking to some of the uh, uh, task force members, they feel like they're not getting the kind of results that they need. They'd rather see a better solution coming out of the task force. I mean, I, I don't know. The only, I, I the only, there's only one task force member I'm aware of that's recommended disbanding it and going to an advisory committee. There's only one person. I, I, the rest of the task force is, Scott hasn't recommended it. Kelly Press, this is my other appointee, doesn't recommend that. I don't know who does. Right? I'm, just, I'm just saying, if we're going to make decisions based on facts, make, make sure we get the facts. Uh -huh. All right? And I don't see that demonstrated at this point. And then the second thing is, if I'm going to, you know, trying to keep people from having to do more work, if I take this whole homeless task force and stick it back on the planning commission, how much work am I reducing for the, the city staff? I still got to do the minutes. I still have to do all the stuff I'm doing now. I just have to do it under a no different umbrella. Why the hell is that good? I mean, I'd rather have this thing focused on the, a, a particular topic by the people who are tasked with keeping that focus going to protect the residents. So, I, you know, I just I don't see the benefit of, of I've, I haven't heard the issue that you raised that says there's, that we're stressing people out. I have not heard the issue from the task force members saying we, you know, we wanted to expand because this is too tough. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I know that's your argument, but I can't find those facts anyplace. Well, um, first of all, I want I want to compliment the whole city council for this, com this this conversation slash discussion. I think this is an excellent example of um, of how we make decisions. Um, Paul's fond of saying I can count. And I mean, as I see it, if we call it the question right now, unless somebody changes their view, it's going to be a three-two vote to um, disband and f and turn this over to the Public Safety Commission. I committed to Doug that I would that it, we reached a compromise and that I would go with that compromise. If you're persuaded by any of the arguments you're hearing and you want to change your decision, I'll be happy to do that too. But if not, I'm going to stay where I promised I would, and and I'll vote to um, disband this and go to the Public Safety Commission. The, as I see it, the most critical issue is, um, is using the task force a drain on staff versus is turning it over to the Public Safety Commission going to be a drain on the Public Safety Commission? And I trust your judgment, having been on that commission for a long time and having been the chair. All right. Um, first off, I left out a very key component of one of the things I was going to say, and that is, and, and I got in my notes, and I apologize. It was to say a big thank you to all the people in the last three plus years that have changed the homeless dynamic in this city. It is the homeless task force has done a part of it, the public safety staff, the sheriff's department, all these people have done yeoman's work. And I got to tell you, when the sheriff, you can talk to some of the sheriffs that are here all the time, and they know almost every homeless person in this town by first name. And I, I, I will pass along a comment that uh, the LAPD uses. That is, it's called the ham sandwich theory. And they sit down and they, it, the sergeant's shaking his head. It's, you walk over to the homeless person and you say, here's a sandwich for you. You build their confidence one person at a time, one agenda at a time. And it's not the homeless task force that's doing that. That's a key, key part of this. It's the staff that we have at public safety, the sheriff's department, the pro, people concerned, and the uh, outreach person, Gabriel from uh, uh, COG. These are the ones that are working diligently on it. What I'm talking about is the staff dedication at public safety primarily, and I'm nobody at public safety has told me to say this, 
But when you realize that there's a task force for homeless meeting once or twice a month, and you've got public safety once a month, and the public safety commission is overlapping much of what's already being done in the homeless task force, we talked about it on parking as an example. It is the public safety department's got parking, and until the homeless task force, they were involved with people sleeping in the cars. So it's already part of their agenda, and it's being doubled up by the homeless task force. And I agree with Paul. Look, when you're on a win, you know, why do you want to take your resources away? On the other hand, we've got other places to put our resources. And the battle is at least a draw right now on homelessness. We're doing a good job with it. And the people are, that are on the front lines are still going to be there. They're not being taken off. We've still got the same people working every day, whether there's a homeless task force or not. So, I'm, yeah, the homeless task force doesn't go out and see anybody. The homeless task force is an advisory board. The people that are doing the work are the sheriff's department, people concerned, and so forth. So I am I'm going to stick with my recommendation that we keep it with public safety. And I agree with Mary Ann. If this bites us in the rear end uh, and it doesn't work out well, I'll be the first one to bring it back on the table. We can always reconstitute this. But it was a task force meant to be transitional. Get the problem solved, move on to another problem. We've got other things in the city to deal with. Let's put those resources to that that uh, calling. Okay? So I'm I'm still going to keep my motion. Okay, so Bruce, thank you for your support. You're welcome. Are there any further comments? Marianne? Yeah, I mean, just looking back through, kind of touching on what Doug said, you know, this, this was created for a specific goal, which was to get recommendations, get some ideas that was focused on particular issues. I think that that's exactly what's been accomplished. They made recommendations. We've got ASL. We've got, you know, recommendations dealing with the fire issues. We've got more focus on making sure that those are cleared out. In addition, we've got the emergency um, ordinances that we've got in place with regards to fires and things. So I think a lot of the stuff that the task force was charged with doing has been accomplished. And so they had a moment in time. They made excellent recommendations. We've incorporated those recommendations and now we've got our public safety department and our public safety commission that can continue to work on those and check those in. And I would say, you know, let's have staff come back to us possibly if that's what we want to hear or do we just want to disband it and let public safety then give us the feedback from there. Paul and Steve, do you have any further comments before yeah. we call the question? <laughs> You keep making arguments to keep the task force in place. You're exactly right. They got they got a charter. They went out and, ma and managed their charter. They got the job done. They've had dramatic results. And I and I know uh, you know Doug says well they don't do any. Sure they do stuff. Okay. I mean they, they don't have to go out and count the homeless. Their, their recommendations are, have been uh, profound. Uh, they we have seen that the, the, the homeless count drop. Uh, back to Paul. If it's working, it ain't broke. Don't fix it. Well, part of the reason why it's dropped is because we've given the tools to our staff. We've given, you know, had conversations with the sheriff's department, so there's a better understanding of exactly how things should be implemented and when things should be enforced and how to enforce them. We've got more um, programs from the MET team and a variety of other agency agencies and other items that have been created through the, the, the last four years that weren't on the books. So there's a multi-layered reason why we've gotten to where we've gotten to. So I, I'm gonna stay with my recommendation that at this time we go ahead and disband the task force and we can um, see what occurs from there and go forward after that. Mr. Mayor, can we call it? Call it? I, I, I have a policy of making sure that everybody gets to have their last word no matter how many times they wanna say it. So. Before we call the question, does anyone else have anything further to say? I can go. Okay, I, I am gonna add one more thing, and I don't think this will prolong it, but um, I, I don't think Doug intended to suggest that anyone who's not actually going out and doing this is not part of the solution. I mean, we all have different skills <laughs> and different um, ways of helping with this situation. I don't go out and count. Uh, I'm not a member of CERT, maybe I should be, but I mean, you know, I, I contribute in other ways. 
So I think that's true of the members of the task force. If they're not out there counting, they're contributing in another way. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is I think the main benefit that the task force provided, which still can, which can also be provided by public safety working with the staff, is that they took this out of the hands, the decisions out of the hands of a volunteer community group, which as somebody made the point, ten, I think it was Bill Sampson maybe, tends to be more the people who want to help join those groups than, than the other side. It's only when the problem gets out of hand that the community starts showing up and saying we need to do something. So the, the, exist, the mere existence of, the, of a Brown Act body that answers to the city council and which publicly does its work was itself a big benefit. And we're not changing that. We're still going to have another a Brown Act body which answers to the public, has public comment, and answers to the city council. So if there's no other comments, we will call the question now. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes. Staff would request if you're going to disband it. It was created by resolution that you return the resolution memorializing the disbandment of the of the uh, task force. If that's the way we have to do it, that'll be the mo that we can change the motion to that up with Doug's approval. And and I think that resolution ought to explicitly state that this will become part of the task of the Public Safety Commission. Doug, uh, I agree with that, and I think what it needs to include that uh, we thank the uh, members of the. Homeless Task Force for all the work and diligence. It can conclude uh, resolution. We wouldn't be where we wouldn't be where we are today without their uh, input and work on this. And you're right, Bruce. I'm not trying to take anything away from them, but we're talking about the same people being on the street that are out there. Not the task force isn't out on the street. Okay. Can we please have a roll call? Mayor Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti. Take just a moment and mention the fact that the task force actually visited tiny home places in four different places. I accompanied them to uh, to a several of them to a place in the valley that was put together by the county. Those things happened, and uh, I'm going to vote no, and it's okay. It's not it's not a problem. That I'm going to get outvoted on this one. Thank you. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem uh, I'm going to vote no also. Before we do, I want to thank all the members of the task force for the job that you guys have done. Uh, I'm sorry you're not getting more recognition for the, the fine effort you put into this, then I'm going to vote no. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, and thank you, thank you all for, I think, was a very good discussion. Really do. If I could say to uh, Mayor, I think this is exactly the way uh, council should work. We should have good input. We may not agree on everything, but it's it's meant to be a decision that we've reached by consensus as best we can, and we've heard all sides. Thank you. Can I move the agenda, please? We're going to move to item 6C, Malibu Farmers Market Fee Waiver. Remote participants, again, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item. And you'll be called after the staff, says after the staff report, actually you'll be called after the other public speakers, if any, that are here in person. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor Silverstein, honorable members of City Council. The item before you is a request for the, from the Cornucopia Foundation to waive facility use and permitting costs for the Ioki property. The Cornucopia Foundation is a community nonprofit organization it has been approved to use Legacy Park as a temporary site for the Sunday Farmer's Market. The foundation uses the Ioki property as a parking area for vendors and attendees. The item for council's consideration is a request from the foundation for a 100% fee waiver in the amount of $29,091 for the current fiscal year and approximately $42,120 for fiscal year 23-24. At the council's request, the foundation has provided financial documents, which is included as an attachment to the staff report. The organization has paid rental and permit fees through April 9th, 2023. If the council chooses to waive these fees, the city will issue the organization a refund and waive the remaining fees until the end of their use. That concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Do we have any public? Speakers. 
No, we haven't received any speaker slips. We don't have any raised hand from the remote. I'm sorry, raised hands from the remote participants. Okay, that would close public comment. I'll make a motion that we approve this item. I'll second it. Any any discussion? Can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Silverstein. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Who is the second? Councilmember Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti. And Councilman Grisanti's mic was off, but he did vote yes. Yes, kinda. <laughs> Councilmember Riggins? No, kinda. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to the final item on tonight's agenda 6E, Assembly Bill AB 1500, property taxation. Again, remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item. You'll be called after any in-person speakers, if there are any. And can we have a staff report on this, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor Silverstein, members of the council. Um, this uh, item before you is a request for a letter of support for an assembly member bill that has been introduced uh, by way of background. Uh, uh, existing law in California does allow owners of properties that were substantially damaged or destroyed in a natural disaster uh, to apply the base year of value to that property to the replacement property, uh, assuming it gets re reconstructed at the same site and approximately the same uh, comparable value. Uh, and you have within five years to do that. Uh, as you're well aware, um, it's we're coming up on five years since the Woolsey fire. Um, and to, rec to, rec to remedy this situation, uh, we've been working uh, with Assembly Member uh, Jackie Irwin, who has introduced uh, legislation this year by way of AB 1500, uh, which, if approved, would extend the five-year time period for uh, that application of that base year exemption, uh, would allow that to be extended from five years to three years, assuming that the, the property was substantially damaged or destroyed in the Woolsey fire. Uh, the bill would apply as well to uh, properties that were also damaged um, in the uh, campfire as well, uh, both of those which occurred in November of 2018. Uh, the bill is scheduled for a hearing uh, before the Assembly Revenue and Tax Committee meeting, uh, which is scheduled for next Monday, April 17th. Uh, if the City Council so authorizes, uh, a letter of support would be submitted uh, to the State Legislature prior to that hearing. Uh, as well, the council may want to consider, uh, if you do take an official ex action uh, to uh, support the bill, council may also want to authorize uh, sending a city official to testify before uh, the uh, Revenue and uh, Tax Committee uh, next week on April 17th. Also wanted to, as part of my report, wanted to offer a, uh, a small change or clarification to the draft letter. Uh, off, if you look at the uh, attachment that's within your packet, on uh, the first paragraph, I'd like to modify that first uh, sentence to make it a little more clear. Right now it reads that the City of Malibu proudly supports AB 1500, which extend the five-year time period uh, to reconstruct homes that were substantially damaged or destroyed. I'd like to modify that so that it reads uh, that the City of Malibu proudly supports AB 1500, which would extend the five-year five time period to maintain the base year property value for homes that were substantially damaged or destroyed in the 2018 Woolsey fire. So I think with that change, it would make the letter a little bit more uh, clear as to what we are requesting. And with that, I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions. Uh, and again, we do have a request if the council uh, would, would so desire uh, to authorize sending an official to speak before the uh, committee next week. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Do I have a question? Okay. So do we have any public speakers? Yes, we have one remote participant. We'll hear from Howard Rudsky. I think we should send the letter, send the official, and do anything else we can to help these people. They deserve our full support. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Any other public comment? No. 
Okay, that takes us to council. Steve, I see you're pressing your button to Just speak. Real quick, and then Paul uh, will go next. Uh, I'm going to make a motion to do exactly what you suggested to send a letter to support a representative going to the meeting. And I want to, in the process of doing that, thank Cal Strategies. Um, they have done a lot of the work helping us get this thing put together. They built the relationship with Jackie Irwin that helped us get this done. Um, and I just think, you know, they deserve a little bit of recognition. And I think um, Mayor Silverstein did an excellent job working with them to get this thing accomplished. So uh, I think this is a good move. This is something good for the council to do. I'm all in favor of it. Paul? I'll second it. And then I want to also thank Steve for the correction to the letter. I think it's a better letter with the change that you're recommending. And uh, whoever came up with that deserves our thanks. Doug? Uh, I just want to make a comment that this actually came from several citizens here in Malibu who were facing a real financial hardship if this didn't get passed or didn't get corrected. And uh, to compliment CalStrat and the city staff and the, everybody here for moving this forward, and especially Jackie Irwin's office. I mean, she stepped right up and, and did it. So uh, thanks to everybody. And this is directly affecting probably the 250 or so homes that are either under construction or in the planning department right now. Otherwise, this is going to be a major cost to them if we don't get it in place. So thanks to everybody for getting it done. Marianne? I just want to echo my thanks um, both to some of the member Irwin's office, to Cal Strats, to all the work by the council members, the mayor, um, our own city staff, and you know, thank you to the residents who did bring this to our attention. See, you can tell us things and we can get things done. So please keep contacting us with these things that concern you. It's really important that you engage. Thanks. Yeah, so I also, I also think that um, I, I, I want to thank Doug, first of all, because um, about two or three months ago, um, he alerted me to the fact that this was an issue. I had not been aware of it. Um, and we didn't discuss what to do or anything like that. But as a result of his alerting me to it, um, I then brought it up at a CalStrat um, conference that we have that Steve and I have every week um, and we all agreed Steve and I and everyone on the phone agreed that it made sense to see what we could do here um, I had asked that we specifically put on the agenda also the authorization to have someone it would be me to go up to um, Sacramento to testify about this I didn't think that should be something we unilaterally decide behind closed doors it should be a council decision as to whether to send someone and who to send um, and I also raised with CalStrat that it seemed to me that it's arguably an unnecessary act that we're spending money and time. I don't mind the time, um, but I was told that it's actually it's something that they believe would be very appropriate and helpful to getting this done, and that's why I'm going to do it if, if approved by council. The other thing is this is being jointly supported by um, the City of Paradise, which also, as everyone knows, suffered actually suffered much more serious um, casualties than we did. And um, I believe, if, I'm, if, I, if I've understood this correctly, they have a Republican um, assembly member that's supporting it. We've got a Democratic assembly member that's supporting it. That's very rare, um, even in California, to have um, bipartisan support. And, and this will require a two-thirds vote, and, and the um, hope and expectation is that it will, it will receive it. Any other comments? Yes. Do we need to dis designate the person who will attend? Any suggestions? Well, the mayor should be the person who goes up. He, you will be the Sacramento. That's Sacramento, I think you said, right? No, I won't be there anyway, but um, who seconded the original motion? It was seconded by Councilmember Santi. Sure. Amendment? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go up and back in the same day. Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Uri? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? You don't need one, please. I know I don't, but I'm I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes, we're Motion adjourned. carries. You are adjourned.
Thanks for staying.